Good morning and welcome to the Data Factory Day. My name is Ebba Josefsson Lindqvist. And I'm Peter Kurzweli. And we are so happy to be here today. Uh, this is going to be a really exciting day. Uh, we have uh, tons of presentations and we also have the grand opening of the Edge Lab. Yes, it's quite a full schedule for today. We'll show you the agenda in just a little bit. Uh, we have a lot of speakers, a very interesting program. Yeah. And uh, we can see one of our speakers already. Hi, Jay, we'll let you in a bit later. And uh, so Eva, the, the mission for today, or what do we want to see happening after today? Because we, what we can see here is all of our partners all over Sweden, ranging from the smallest startups and, and uh, small and medium-sized enterprises to large corporations and public sector. What do we want to see happen after today? We just want everyone to understand that you can engage with the data factory. And there are tons of ways that you can get engaged. And we will show some examples throughout the day how other partners have joined uh, AI Sweden and especially with the data factory, found other partners to collaborate with and created value for themselves from the data factory. So that's really the essence. That's what we want to see as the outcome. So we look forward to having massive amounts of emails coming in <laughs> after with contact uh, to see how. But this is really to give you some inspiration of what you can do, find your challenges and bring them here. Yeah, and uh, for those of you who are new to AI Sweden, uh, what you can see in the image right now or at your computer screen is all of our AI Sweden's partners. Uh, we are close to or over 100 partners now, uh, ranging from uh, Luleå up in the north uh, down to Malmö in the south. And we are a series, we have a series of nodes uh, across Sweden. And today we're broadcasting this from uh, our main node uh, in Gothenburg in Lind at Lindholm Science Park. And what's truly interesting, uh, I see it, is that AI Sweden has the mission to accelerate applied AI all across the Swedish sector, both in the private sector and in the public sector. And to do this, we need an infrastructure, and yes. that's what we're going to talk about today. And we also want to show with this picture that we actually just passed over 100 partners, which is quite amazing That's really for such a new uh, organization. Really cool. Uh, and uh, when it comes to uh, to the national initiatives, because mm -hmm. I know this is a huge sector uh, focus for the data factory, even though the first Edge Lab, that, yeah. that's also something that we need to say, the first Edge Lab will be have its grand opening today here at Lindholm Science Park. It is a resource to be used all across Sweden. Absolutely. And it's going to be accessible from wherever you are in Sweden. It might even be accessible from, from abroad. You will hear about some examples of that as well. Uh, but definitely it's a, it's a national resource. Yeah. And we are looking forward to also establishing physical locations in the other nodes uh, where partners can bring in their equipment, for example. Yeah. So. So if you're an organization uh, or a, a business uh, in uh, one of these areas, either the north, the south, uh, the greater east or the west, uh, around the or stuff like that, we have sister organizations that are uh, our nodes in these areas. So if you're up in the uh, north, then it's uh, Skellefteå Science Park and, and Luleå Science Park or Skellefteå Science City. And then you can see uh, the list ranging uh, down from, from the north down to the south. Uh, so really try to engage with us. If you're curious or if you're interested in, in learning more about the data factor or what AI Sweden has, uh, the opportunities within AI Sweden, really make sure to, to send us an email. Absolutely. And why is the data factory so important in this area? As you're saying, this is really something for the practical approach of AI. So we want to provide the infrastructure needed uh, for partners to come and test AI uh, training, for example, and a lot of different things that we compile in the concept of the data factory. So what you can see on the, on the different circles here that connect and what we all believe is really the basics that you need to be successful with AI within your organization is that you need the business understanding and you need the AI expertise, but you also need the data and the infrastructure to provide um, for these AI trainings and solutions. Yeah. And today we're going to be a bit technical. Yes. Uh, we're going to focus a lot on the AI expertise in the technology circle. And what we've learned during the last two years since we've been up and, and running as an organization uh, is that 
to be successful within AI. Technology is one hugely important part, but one aspect that we tend to forget in techno uh, mm. technological discussions is the management part. It's the cultural part. And that's why the business understanding and uh, that your organization is a part of this transformation as well. Uh, so uh, the coming year, uh, we from AI Sweden, we will of course have a, a technical focus where we'll have a lot of focus on, on the Edge Lab, uh, on developing the, the resources yeah. in the data factory. But we will also add a lot of elements when it comes to educating and uh, coaching management teams mm. uh, so we really want to uh, make a mark for that as well uh, if you're curious let us know because we can really help you accelerate your ai transformation and i also want to emphasize that the value creation that you see in the middle of the circle that's really what we're going to focus on today like how you can make good value out of the data factory both in terms of the education part we also can see legal, for example, that one of the structures that is needed to succeed in sharing data, for example, or sharing models. So those are examples of things that we will see throughout this half day. So the agenda for today, Eva. Yes. We'll start off now with an introduction to the data factory. We'll hear a bit more about the um, infrastructure that we have accessible today uh, with our partner CGIT. Um, and then we'll have the very exciting opening of the Edge Lab. We'll move on to that in a short while. And then the last bit of today, we'll focus on how to make this vision into a reality and show some case studies of uh, partners that have been used in the data factory already and how you can engage. Yeah. So that's it. Um, we now want to welcome in Mats Nordlund, yeah. who is acting head of the data factory. Yeah. Thank and you, Peter. I will see you later. Yeah, and you will be coming in and out a little bit, uh, looking at the chat, looking at the Q and A that we really want you to use throughout the day. Uh, a lot of, of um, the slots will be quite short, so make use of the typing in your questions in the Q and A tab, and then we'll help out and get some help from Peter uh, to respond to the questions. Most of the panelists will also stay on and be able to type in a question for you or an answer to your question. And we also want to say just that this is being recorded, uh, just so everybody knows that. And we are aiming to put it up on our YouTube channel after the event. Might take a few days, but that's the aim. Welcome, right. Mats. Thank you so much, Eva. Pleasure to be here and a pleasure to see so many participating in, in this um, webcast and you are the acting head of the data factory right. and i'm the project manager of the data factory so what does it make us really batman and robin oh, something Perhaps. like that yeah, something i like don't know that, I guess. No. <laughs> no it's so. a we're, we're a team yeah, working absolutely. on the data factory and we'll show you some other team members later yes we introduce the entire team here in the morning but we should move on on the slides and Mats, yeah. I think you can control it from so, there. Um, thanks so much, Eva. I'm going to take you through a very brief journey of the history of the data factory so that you have some understanding of what, where we are and, and how we got here. Um, when we were planning to set up AI Sweden, which was about three years ago, uh, we were at that time focusing on what we here uh, illustrate as the research arena, which was really doing much what was done in other countries uh, to set up a place for industry, academia and others to collaborate on developing and train algorithms. We got some advice from colleagues in industry saying that, you know, you should really consider having a data factory as well. And that would enable you to let the uh, people working on algorithms work with the people who develop the data and develop the infrastructure. And by having them close together, we think that you can bring both of them up very rapidly. And that could be a key to AI Sweden being able to run faster than comparable uh, initiatives in other places. So that was sort of the original idea of why we set up the data factory from the beginning. So the question then was, what is a data factory and what should it be like? Is it just a storage and compute uh, system or is it something else? Looking into uh, what you can see here is a typical S-curve used to represent the development of technology over time. You can see performance going from an infancy point and then going up to maturity and uh, the, what's going on in these different stages. And when we looked into the data factory setups, there was a lot of different uh, initiatives, a lot of different uh, architecture, a lot of different solutions. So we said that it could really be considered to be at the infancy place. Of course, each hardware component was rather mature, but how you put them together wasn't completely obvious. So <clears throat> with that, uh, we try to explore and try to think about what is the best thing for us to do. Uh, 
At the same time here in Sweden, we could see that there's an emerging ecosystem of uh, storage and compute solutions being invested in and located at many universities in industry uh, and also at some research institutes. At the same time, uh, international cloud providers were offering more and more advanced services for us to, to also tap into. Uh, we are very happy to see very recently announced uh, uh, investment from the Wallenberg Foundation at Linköping, which is uh, coming up here soon with a, a super pod, which is fantastic uh, uh, infrastructure for training algorithms. So this was what was going on around us that we could observe. And our question was, how can we complement this and how can we add value to what is already going on? So we um, created this model, a simple idea to, to think around, where we said that whatever we do should have value both to the users, people who train algorithms and want to do innovation, but also to the companies and partners who build and provide the technology, the infrastructure. And we should be complementary to the other investments so that we don't do another one that's just the same. And <clears throat> what we have this model you can see here to illustrate is that at AI Sweden, we get together and we work together, both users and providers of this technology to learn, to develop new ideas, to develop new architectures and explore what should be the best solution of infrastructure for a certain problem. Maybe it's not one size fits all, maybe it's somewhat tailored. And that is what we should enable you to do here at AI Sweden. Once we have learned that, we can then take what we've learned here into the ecosystem, into the commercial world or into some other uh, practicing world where you can then set up your systems um, as part of your business or as part of your or agency or organization. The vision we created for the data factory is to be a place where we get together and collaborate to push the boundaries and cut, develop the cutting edge infrastructure and tools and models and also share know-how how to do this so that we can all accelerate together and learn from each other. So that's a general idea. Get together here, bring in your knowledge, bring in your problems, sit down with your peers and, and move fast. And then also, of course, not only on the infrastructure side, but also on the algorithm side so that we can collaborate on that. Uh, we identified five ways where we can provide value or where you can come here and, and work with us. Uh, to start up on the top right, um, the, uh, number one there was to explore data factory solutions, set up different ways uh, and compare, benchmark, learn, um, then share that knowledge you, that you've created of how to set it up, uh, develop tools and tool chains together. We've seen that there's a bit of a lack of such uh, tools for us in industry. Um, then. Uh, several of uh, the partners here have already donated data sets and models and we have more coming in and this should be a place where we can all share and benefit from them and of course to some extent provide resources and storage and compute so that you can train your models. So the big value creation of course is on innovation but also it helps you to reduce risk when you select solutions going forward into your organizations and it is a way where we can learn from each other to accelerate the AI development. So that's sort of the, the, the brief background uh, of why we are where we are today. And I'm from here going to pass it back on to, to Eva to talk a little bit more about what is in the data factory today. I think we should switch places for that's this one because then I can lift the PowerPoints. And exactly, Max, thank you so much. That's really good to have a little bit of a background on the data factory. And now what is the data factory today then? So first of all, we want to show our amazing team. Uh, we have our fantastic data scientist, uh, Shitan Reddy. Um, she was actually recruited after one of the hackathons that we did earlier um, mm. in the beginning of AI Sweden's time. And then we have Ola Eriksson, our technical advisor. Uh, we have Daniel Gilblad, who is the scientific vision uh, person. Uh, Josefine Remsgård, which is working on the legal side together with me. And then of course you. We have incoming Erik Wendlund, who we're looking forward to welcoming into the team very soon. And then we also, of course, want to uh, point out that we have, first of all, a few students that work with us, uh, which is great. And we also are very lucky to have partners contribute with work uh, force or sending actually their employees to work here with the Data Factory team. Uh, so that's something that we really appreciate and think really brings value to us, but also to the organizations that are sending these people over. 
And then, of course, we also want to send uh, out that we are recruiting continuously. So uh, stay tuned, look at our website and, uh, and uh, see if there's something that could fit some of you or a colleague or uh, someone else that you know. And then the data factory today, uh, you could say it comprises three main parts. It's the AI training environment and the infrastructure that we will learn more about just shortly now when CGIT will present what we have in the infrastructure today. Uh, we also have the test bed part, which is a very important part of what we here at AI Sweden want to do with the data factory as a test bed for data factory solutions and for new AI technologies. So this is where you can explore and develop new infrastructure, new hardware or software tool chains, etc. It's really up to you. And then we have the compliance and competence bit. And uh, with compliance, me, for example, with my legal background, I'm running part of that. Uh, we want to share all the knowledge that we can get. So we also have competence as uh, an overall picture for the technical side, for the legal side, and everything in between that relates to the data factory. And we want to show you some of the partner contributions that we've had already. A CGIT I mentioned with infrastructure. Google, one of our big partners, uh, also are contributing to the data factory with their cloud platform, which is amazing. We have uh, HPE that we will hear more from today, how they have engaged in the Edge Lab, for example. Um, and then we have Rice, of course, and Örebro University. They also have their own data factories and we collaborate really closely with them. And then we have the test bed where we will see some of these partners uh, present what they are doing in the Edge Lab in a short while. And then of course, for AI, it's really key to have good data. And um, we are really lucky to have some partners that have already contributed with uh, good data sets for AI trainings. For example, AstraZeneca, Volvo and um, SLU, um, uh, the Agriculture University in Sweden. Uh, and we will actually have the release of the Volvo data set later today. So we have Henrik come in and tell us more about this new data set. And then we have some more discussions about incoming data sets. So there's also a lot of happening on that side. Um, and I mentioned some of these uh, data set already. Uh, what you can really make out of uh, the data sets for the donator is, for example, a challenge or a hackathon that we see can really contribute um, to generate knowledge and also give a lot back to the donor on what you can do with your data sets. Um, the data factory and the test bed of the data factory is listed on Vinova as one of their official test beds for Sweden and this one then for data factory solutions. I was mentioning the compliance and competence part of the data factory, uh, where I and Yusufin are heading the legal uh, work packages, for example, or uh, the legal work that we do around the data factory. We'll hear more about that in a while. And then we have the infrastructure, which is under establishment, so to speak. So we will establish a legal, an expert group connected to the infrastructure of data factories on how to build data factories. And of course, we welcome students to take part and maybe um, write their master theses connected to AI and take part of the amazing network that we can offer here at AI Sweden. So to kind of sum it up and show you in a different way what the data factory uh, entails, we say it's a foundation that you need with storage and compute, the legal knowledge, technical know-how, and of course, data management and tool chains. And then that interconnects with the solutions that you can come and create here together with other partners. And you can train your models and you can collaborate and develop new solutions. And then of course, on top of all of that, still interconnecting with the others is the test bed where we want you to uh, see what the Edge Lab is today. Uh, federated learning is something that we also work with the projects on and then other data factory solutions. Kind of all of this, we will touch in one way or the other throughout this day. So how can you then make the most out of this? The hackathons, for example, uh, come and use the infrastructure. Just reach out to us and get access to the data factory. If you have data scientists in your organization, ask them to come and, and connect with us and see if they can use the infrastructure. And then we have the test bed and the knowledge groups where you can get engaged. So really, learn and set up in the foundation, use and share and collaborate in the solutions and then innovate in the testbed. And with that, we will 
start with the infrastructure and get a little bit deeper into what we actually offer today. Right. And uh, I will actually let you go, Mats, for a little bit. We'll see you quite soon. And I will invite Christian and Simon. Hello, Christian. Hello, Eva. Nice Good, to see you. We can hear you well. That's, uh, that's excellent. Excellent. I will bring it on from here uh, for 10 minutes. Yes, please. Uh, yeah. So my name is Christian Gustafsson uh, and I work uh, for CGIT as a CVO. And uh, we have been involved in AI Sweden as a core technology partner uh, since the actual, actual start at Lindholmen. And we have been designing deep learning infrastructures for almost five years now. And from the beginning, we realized that the most important thing when it comes to deep learning infrastructures is that there is a workable solution that can be used for trading 24 seven. So uh, when, with this in mind, uh, we quite soon uh, realized that we have to go for an appliance approach so that we have things that works uh, very, very easy. Uh, and our goal has always been to simplify and not just see the GPU part of a deep learning infrastructure as an appliance, but ensure that we can deliver the entire deep learning infrastructure as a turnkey solution. Uh, from our perspective, uh, a working deep learning infrastructure is the foundation for successful AI research. So we designed actually from the ground and up. So the entire data factory is based on our design and it runs in our data center with proven technology from the most innovative vendors on the market. So in addition to using those uh, innovative vendors, we have learned that existing tools for orchestrating this type of workload has not been adapted because those were made probably 10 or 20 years ago for HPC. So we therefore uh, developed our own tool to both administrate and maintain a deep learning infrastructure. So we will now show you a lightboard session where we describe uh, the actual, actual solution that runs uh, for the data factory at AI Sweden. Yeah, so welcome to the data factory day. Uh, Today we're going to talk a little bit about the actual data factory that we have here mm -hmm. at AI Sweden. And together with me now, I have Simon. Yeah, I'm well, Simon Janek. I've uh, been with CJT for a couple of years and worked with uh, AI Sweden since the start. Okay. Yeah, so uh, when it started mm -hmm. four years ago, I think, a little bit more, we started to building the deep learning infrastructures yeah. uh, who results of GPUs. Mm -hmm. exactly. And um, uh, we quite soon realized that there were some mm -hmm. issues with the workflow and so on. Yeah. Can you elaborate a little bit about that? So we were in contact with our, our previous customers, uh, or existing customers, and we realized that they were doing uh, AI research, um, and they were doing it on GPU machines. Uh, so we looked around and see how can we improve the workflow. Uh, so, so we got in contact with the leading um, producers, um, and we made sure we got some actual GPU machines. So we got boxes that we stuck in racks. They had a couple of GPU uh, graphics cards in them yeah. uh, for research. Okay. Uh, so we provided that for internal research on our customers, uh, and everything was dandy. Okay. Uh, so we had a powerful platform at the bottom. Yeah. So this is more like a server, is it an appliance, or what uh, kind of uh, technology or solution? Well, is well it? In, in the base, it's an actual x86 server, yeah, uh, okay. but it is compacted in a way that is an appliance approach. Okay. Um, so it has a, a fully supported contract that has a few softwares that helps you get started, um, and everything is very easy to get started with. Okay. So that was one of the key points why we choose this product, actually. All right, all right. Yeah, so, so this product, uh, uh, I heard, it. It's a six, five, six petaflops yeah, of exactly. performance in the, this tiny mm -hmm. little box. Yeah, so, so this is a 6U box and we can uh, get about five petaflops from it. Yeah. Um, that was not the case a few years ago, but today that's the case. Okay. And it's super compact and extremely comp yeah. capable of hardware. Yeah. Okay. So the data factory, is it just an appliance or is it more mm -hmm. uh, to go I with? I see your question. Yeah. No, it's not just uh, this little box. This has been extended quite heavily. Okay. Um, so, so we quickly realized, or our customers um, together with us realized that this was not an optimal workflow. Okay. Um, we needed to move data onto the box and off the box when we trained. Yeah. And the actual data movement took longer than the actual training. So that was very suboptimal. Okay. Uh, so we introduced a, a, a layer uh, of shared storage. 
Okay. Um, NVMe storage, actually. Yeah. 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 And so that is the, the super fast flash disks, uh, NVMe, the, the latest technology. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Yeah. So that was, was uh, the, the absolute latest at the time. Yeah. Uh, still is. This is still in development. So this is the hottest, best performance you can get. Yeah. Uh, so we connected that over to the system, uh, and we managed to get training um, very fast on the machine yeah. without actually moving data back and forth. Okay, all the time. Yeah, okay, I understand. So we train, yeah. we train from data straight yeah. from there. Yeah. So then, uh, is it only the NVMe storage mm. and the, the, the GPU boxes, and yeah, or, exactly. or how do you interconnect this? Is it is it more in the yeah. in the solution? So, so so we start with simple switches, uh, and that quickly become a become a problem. So we, okay. we added some very capable switch stacks in the middle here. Okay. Um, and the key point here mm. is deep buffer. So deep buffer managed to keep our our TCP windows open, uh, so we actually get. Um, the flow, because this is a very bursty workload. Oh, okay. so, yeah. so we need to keep the windows open so we get the flow working, even though it's a very unhomogenized workflow. Okay, I understand. So um, you had to eliminate some, you have some bottlenecks in the exactly, system uh, yeah. from the beginning, mm -hmm. and you solved that with... Uh, deep buffer switches. Ah, deep buffer. Exactly. Oh, I heard of those. Yeah. Uh, I heard that they say that uh, less is not more. More is exactly. more when it yeah. comes to deep buffer. Key point, oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, cool. More is always more. Yeah, um, that's cool. Yeah. So this, this allowed our customers to actually do some serious training very fast over the network. OK, yeah. So, yeah, OK, so you can keep those machines busy more or mm -hmm. less 24-7 then. Yeah, ah, and that's especially cool. important once we start adding nodes here. Yeah. So when we go from one node to four or five or ten nodes, yeah. this becomes very, very important. So the switch layer quickly becomes the, the bottleneck okay. if you don't take very good care of this layer. Oh, OK, uh, I totally understand. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So now we have this solution here. and as you. Right, they pointed out there. It's a scalable solution yeah, as well. Absolutely. So you can just add nodes uh -huh. as exactly. long as you have ports and you so have storage. So we can add we can add more storage yeah. in forms of NVMe. We can add more nodes in forms yeah. of switches. Okay. We can even build this layer to actually be a, a, a stackable solution okay. instead of a, a normal switch. Yeah. So you have the scalable uh, platform and so on. Was there anything more? I realized that mm -hmm. NVMe, I heard, is quite uh, valuable or yeah, expensive. Exactly. So, so this is a very expensive layer. OK. Uh, yeah. To keep your storage, especially if you have, I mean, all the storage in this system is very hot storage. Yeah. Um, but of course, there's hard, colder and hotter storage in this. Ah, okay. so, so we also implemented a, a large uh, data shared okay. uh, bucket over here. All right. Um, a multi-petabyte storage. Um, okay. This is a couple of hundred terabytes. This is multiple petabytes. Yeah. So we connected this up to the system in the same way yeah. to have access to the system from here. Uh, and this could be lifted up to the MV for training, or it could yeah. be accessed from the system, or it could be accessed from clients externally yeah. through this network yeah. layer. Yeah. And I also heard that uh, the appliance, uh, they told that this is a turnkey solution and mm -hmm. so on. We uh, actually took it a little bit uh, uh, yeah. further away. Exactly. So the complete deep learning infrastructure, mm -hmm. it's more or less a yeah. turnkey. It's complex, but yeah, uh, exactly. it's a turnkey solution. So, so this is advertised as a turnkey solution. Yeah. We added multiple layers to this. Yeah. Now, this is not a turnkey solution anymore. Yeah. But we actually managed to pull all this together with software and with our expertise to make it a very good and, and homogenized yeah. environment for the customers to use. Yeah. So, so, so we advertise this, and we, we absolutely expect this to work as a, a turnkey solution for the customer. Yeah. Ah, cool. Yeah, because I heard of it. Uh, this kind of installs that can take weeks or mm -hmm. maybe months Absolutely. and so on. But uh, this is a modern product, mm -hmm. uh, okay. self-driving product, more, yeah. more or less, that interconnects mm -hmm. with, with each other. Uh, uh, each of these components can actually be installed um, like in parallel, yeah. um, and everything is less than a day to install. Oh, so, so we can have this day. all hooked up. Yeah. So I can Absolutely. train my data sets in yeah. less than a day. If you order today, we can install uh, it tomorrow. Yeah, <laughs> I heard so at AI Sweden, they are very happy with the yeah. solution because it's very simple to use and Absolutely. to maintain and so on. Yeah. But uh, still, it's a complex picture for me. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, was there anything else during this uh, when you're getting mm -hmm. more experience yeah. uh, working together with the data scientists and mm -hmm. working with deep learning experts? Yeah. I heard something about the uh, scheduling and uh, orchestration exactly. and so on. Can you? Uh, yeah, tell us a little bit so, about so that. So we need to keep those busy. Yeah. That's the that's the gist of it. So we need to put in jobs to these machines to keep them busy at all oh, times. Yeah. So, so we managed to pull uh, our, our heads together with our, our um, uh, team and our customers. Yeah. Uh, to pull out you know, so <laughs> where. Uh, layer. Yeah. Uh, so, so we yeah. built a scheduler software. I hope you're. I hope you're better uh, in <laughs> doing, than writing and configure <laughs> things and so yeah. on than you are in writing. Yeah. Uh, so, so we built a scheduler <laughs> to be able to push jobs into the DJX where okay. they read from this. All right. So we can build the whole system yeah. with a single pane of glass to okay. be able to train yeah. and do your your inference work. Okay. Cool. 
I, I heard uh, that there are other things like data pipelining and so mm -hmm. on. But uh, for sure, yeah, that's that's other systems we're, we're working together to to, to solve those issues, mm -hmm. um, and we have exciting news um, okay. later on today. Exciting news! Yeah, yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, we'll share some some juicy goods later on today as well. Okay. Yeah. So you have another session later on. Yeah. Uh, okay. No, but yeah. now there will be a software session, uh, yeah. where we'll go in deeper into this layer yeah. uh, and announce some new things as well. Yeah. Uh, but with this kind of a deep learning infrastructure solution, mm -hmm. uh, compared to the legacy vendors or, or so on, uh, yeah. uh, that have uh, old file systems and so on, mm -hmm. uh, you say one day to install a solution yeah, like it's, this, it's that, is, that is impressive. Mm -hmm. yeah. For sure. Yeah. And that's, but uh, that's this is one of the key points. Every, every component here is very modern. Yeah. 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 And everything is, is, is there, there's no uh, waterfall installation in this. Everything ah. can be installed parallel, okay. and we hook it all together, and, all and we right. make it work. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then we train the people on software and then they're, they're off. Okay. So it's very effective. All right. Yeah. So yeah, I think this very much concludes the, the, the stack of the, yeah. the components yeah. in the data factory today. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So I think that this is the key message. Absolutely. A turnkey solution yeah. for this uh, mm -hmm. quite complex infrastructure. Yeah. All these components built yeah. together to, to solve a, a complex issue for okay. customers. Yeah. Yeah, and you will come back later to today. Yep. Yeah. Okay. I'll be here in about an hour uh, to again talk talk more about the software. Layer. Okay. Yeah. So that will Excellent. be exciting. Yeah. I thank you very Tune much to us. explain this for me, uh, Simon. So yeah. stay Hope tuned for the next session. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Christian. Uh, I really love this video. It explains something very complicated in a fairly not complicated way. Uh, but Christian, if we have you there still. Um, you were saying that some news will come up later uh, in the session. Some of your colleagues will present some, some interesting news, right? Yeah, there will be very interesting news uh, later on in an hour or so um, when it comes to the software stack or software stacks. Yeah, absolutely. That's perfect. And so if someone wants to reach out to you, how, how do they find you? Except for here at AI Sweden, but... Yeah, they find us at the cgit.se. Uh, and I think uh, that's the best way to approach us because we have all, all the contact information for both the uh, sales marketing and the special AI specialists, the AI engineers there. Yeah. So they are, can feel free to contact us. That sounds great. And as we said, you guys can see the Q&A chat. So if anyone in the audience wants to ask a question, please type in your question and uh, Christian or Simon uh, can answer it right away for you. Yeah, absolutely. We will be happy to do so. Thank you so much, Christian. Uh, we'll yeah. see you guys a little bit later. Uh, but now we are actually heading over to Mats on the edge. Right. Uh, thank you, Elba. Um, I have walked a short distance here in uh, Gothenburg and arrived here at our node site in Lindholm. Uh, with me here um, in this section, I have also Anna Grane, who is joining us from Stockholm. Um, and we also have some colleagues who are up in the middle of the night in uh, the United States who is going to come in and present themselves here in, in a short while. Um, with that, um, I'd like to bring on the, the presentation. Uh, if you can put that on, Heba. Uh, it's being broadcasted from the main studios here so that we have that up. But I wanted to start off by saying that here at AI Sweden, we have a number of strategic research programs. And many of them touch the data factory in one way or another. Some of them are very focused on the, the data factory. Specifically, uh, what we're talking about today uh, is the one that's, um, that's coming up here, the slide, I think, in a short, in a second or so, is called the centralized AI. And within that research program area, we have right now two main initiatives. One is called Federated Machine Learning, which is a special project where a number of, of you who are partners are participating and what Anna and I are going to open for you today, which is on the next slide, uh, and we call it the Edge Lab. The Edge Lab uh, was conceived as an idea uh, in collaboration between Zensact and HP. Um, yeah, I have two roles uh, myself here. I am head of research at Zensact, and it was in that role that uh, the discussions we had with HP led to the conception of the Edge Lab. And Anna is going, has been very helpful, and her colleagues, not least, uh, in making this a reality. Uh, she will come back a little bit later and, and talk about, from their perspective, from the HPE perspective, what they see and, and how they've been thinking about this. But starting up, 
I will give a short background and, and ask ourselves, why is the edge important? Why, why do we even look here? And from the industry perspective, we see that we want a lot of data. It was touched on by Ebba earlier on that we need more and more data and we to train better and better algorithms. At the same time, we also see we want to share this data with others. We want to transfer data from one country to another. But there is now emerging legislation in many countries. Uh, many of us here have um, encountered the GDPR, which is one legislation we have to consider with dealing with data. And other countries, there are similar legislations, some of the even stricter. We also see that as we collect data, energy need goes up. Our costs for data storage increases and increases. Data transfer um, is another area. And we get some latency. The more data we have and that we need to transfer, the longer time it takes. And then, of course, as I said, compliance. Um, if you project this into the future, it looks like the current direction of just adding data and big, building bigger and bigger storage is not a sustainable direction. So we can ask ourselves now who needs this and who, who is really affected by these concerns. And on the next slide, you'll see that when we looked around, uh, edge technology really applies in all sectors. Here are some examples where, when I was looking around, um, where I found some discussions, some papers, some articles or something like that, looking at how can we use the edge or some examples of actually using the edge. So you can see it's ranging from uh, hardware, technical products, um, like automotive, all the way into finance, real estate, insurance, consumer products, food production, and, and so forth. So it really is a technology that applies to everybody, which is why we thought that putting an edge lab here at um, AI yeah, Sweden really can benefit us all who are members here. Uh, so from the next slide, you'll see what is it really that we want? If you sort of go back one or two slides, you think about what did we say there? It, it comes down to that we, in industry, we want more data, but at the same time, we want less data because it's getting too cumbersome. We want to share the data, but at the same time, we want to keep it private. And that can perhaps um, be most clear in, in the hospital and the medical healthcare area where you can't legally share data between hospitals and others, but you'd really like to. And you want to transfer the data, but you have to keep it local. So it's a number of paradoxes uh, if you apply the traditional thinking around how to deal with data in data factories. So that led us to asking the fundamental questions in a slightly different ways. And as you can see on the next slide, uh, we made an observation together with several of our partners. Uh, if you move aside uh, in the studio, please. Um, uh, we asked the fundamental questions in a, in a slightly different way. We said data is born on the edge, and the edge is being out at the end user devices or, or out where the, our equipment exists. Why don't we keep it there? Why do we need to bring it back? And we say we want to collect the data, but is it really the data that we need? Or couldn't it be the knowledge, the parameters in our algorithms that we could bring back instead? And if you ask these questions and look for technology that can solve that, we came across uh, um, uh, federated learning. And that is shown on the next slide. And it also explains very briefly how federated learning works. So the technology was first proposed uh, in a paper by Google, uh, as far as we can tell, in 2016. And here are some examples how we would apply it in the automotive, just to explain the idea. You let the compute power in the cars train the algorithms. And each car train on whatever data it can collect or see. Then it transfers the parameters from the algorithms back to a central location where we can federate it. We can merge it. And then we can send it back out to the cars again. And then we can repeat this over and over. Another implementation at the bottom here of the same idea is uh, what's called swarm learning or mesh learning. And here, you don't use that central location, but instead, you create a, a network or a swarm of, of devices, cars, aircraft, hospitals, whatever it might be that you work with. And you let them train locally, and then pick one of these nodes as the federating units, send the parameters there, combine them, and then transfer it back out again. Then you can repeat this cycle and your algorithm will become better and better as you go. But on the next slide, you'll see there are a lot of questions how you do it. It's conceptually reasonably easy to understand it, but we have a whole bunch of questions to actually make it real. Some of the questions you have here on the right uh, on how to set it up, the architecture, the compute plans, uh, how to annotate what you use as a ground truth, 
if you're training out in the edge and, and on and on and so forth. Um, the picture you can see on the left was taken from Nature, which published an article recently on how to apply federated learning in, in the healthcare side, on the medical side. And this is really why we built the Edge Lab, is to try to answer these questions and look at different applications and work together here to see how can we figure out what technology or topology works, which use cases does this work for and which ones doesn't it work for. And as part of setting up the teams and the, the people to start answering this question, we are um, happy to announce or to introduce our colleagues from, from MIT. Um, and I think we have Jay online here to introduce the team who started working together with us here about two weeks ago uh, on this to just introduce your team briefly on who you are and, and what you are, are doing. So Jay, over to you. And thank you so much for being up at about three in the morning, I think your time right now. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Yeah, it is 3.15 almost. Um, happy to be here. Uh, yeah, this is very exciting. Um, so um, we at uh, MIT kind of grouped together uh, some colleagues, my colleague Andrew. Um, he is with John Deere and leading a team on automation. Uh, he, he has some real AI applications uh, in Deere. Uh, Mohit is working as a technical uh, manager with both the audio devices in automotive sector mostly. Um, and Yulia, she's a software engineer with Bumba. Um, and I, Jay, uh, I have been leading um, a systems and controls team at GKN, um, primarily focused on electromechanical systems. Some AI applications are also coming up. Um, my colleague, uh, uh, Mohit is also here. He may introduce uh, about our mission, what we are trying to achieve, uh, partnering with uh, AI Sweden. Mohit? Thanks, Jay. Um, very excited to be here. Thank you, Mats and AI Sweden for the opportunity to participate in this workshop as well as uh, help out in this project. So. We just started about two weeks back uh, and we are trying to brainstorm our project mission. So the way we have put it right now is uh, we would like to help develop and propagate applied AI uh, for AI Sweden's partners by developing a strategy architecture and use cases in key industries uh, using federated edge learning. Um, some of the areas that are very interesting to us is uh, are <clears throat> in the automation and machine learning uh, areas. Uh, many of us have some exposure in our current roles, uh, as well as MIT SDM has provided us with a bunch of tools that we are hoping to utilize to get some exciting results out of this project. Um, and again, I think just to put it in uh, in a sentence, we are excited to be living on the edge. Thank you. Over to you, Jay. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Jay and Mohit. Um, it's fantastic to have you guys with us. And that's um, really fun to see how quickly we get up and going here. And, and now what I'd do, like to do is to pass it on to Anna Grane, who is the CEO of HPE Sweden. She and her colleagues have been extremely important, uh, together with the colleagues from Zensact and Volvo and others, to make the Edge Lab real. And I am going to pass it over to Anna for a, a brief overview of the HPE view on this. Thank you so much. And, and thank you as well to the MIT team that you actually stood up so early in the morning. I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to following your work and, and listening to your conclusions. So um, I don't know if you know HPE so much. We have a, quite a long history of driving innovation, even since we were founded back in Silicon Valley in 1939. So I would dare to say that innovation is truly part of, of our DNA. And we have a long track record also of openness and leveraging partnership as a key enabler for innovation. And uh, today our portfolio is really focused on enabling our customers and partners to be edge-centric, data-driven, and, and cloud-enabled. 
And we truly believe that it's really the edge data that will drive the next level of AI innovation. So when I was introduced to the AI.SC's mission by Mats, among others, I quickly realized that this would be a perfect um, context for HPE to be engaged, um, that we could really play a key role together with the AI.SC's other partners uh, and to be able to develop this sandbox that we have now, we're really looking at today. So I would have to say as well that the Edge Lab is truly unique. I mean, Max, we usually say that we believe this is the most state-of-the-art Edge Lab that we know it, of, at least in, in the world right now. So I think um, we're really proud to be able to enable this together with the other ecosystem partners. And uh, our contribution is that we, we have uh, put in place our latest edge technology, our software and services. And we have also a local team engaged and you will soon hear Peter Werdenhoff and Johan von Dien speak a little bit about what we're doing and hope demo what you can do in the lab. But we have also ensured that we have our global team engaged. So we have our global AI R&D colleagues deeply involved uh, together with Max and the team and uh, will continue to be so. As, as I said before, we are really looking for co-development and co-innovation. So it's really a win-win setup for us to be able to contribute and, and um, participate actively in the lab. And we also have, I'm very proud that the look, we have an executive sponsor as well in form, in form of Antonio Neri, who is the global CEO of Sweden. He's also been in Gothenburg several times and he's personally really interested to follow and see, you know, what new business values we can co-develop together in, in the Ad Edge Lab. And I also am really happy to say that he's recorded a personal message to all of us uh, for this grand opening day. So I would like us to maybe play that movie. Good evening. My name is Antonio Neri, President and CEO of Hewlett Packard Enterprise. I'm excited to be with you to celebrate the opening of AI Sweden's Edge Lab today. At HPE, we predicted that the enterprise of the future will be edge-centric, cloud-enabled, and data-driven. Today, it is not just a vision of the future, it is reality. We are now in the next wave of digital transformation, fueled by apps and data everywhere where everything is connected from the edge to the cloud, where enterprises unlock value everywhere, revealing new opportunities, new experiences, and new discoveries. To enable this new age of insight, HPE has invested in the technology, services, and software required to enable AI. Turning data into actionable insights means putting intelligence close to data sources to create real-time insights and action everywhere. I am happy that we are able to bring our innovation to you through the AI Edge Lab, and I believe that the lab will become a greater enable for the AI Sweden community to accelerate the adoption of new AI use cases in Sweden. I would like now to hand it over to Mats Norlund, who will give you a more detailed picture of the Edge Lab and what we can accomplish together. Thank you and stay safe. Thank you so much, uh, Anna and uh, Antonio. And what we are going to do now, we're going to um, take you in to the real Edge Lab and do the grand opening, which is essentially opening a door. And, and what you will see is more or less what you can see on this picture here. Uh, you can revisit this picture. We will post it so you can see more of the details later. But what we want to do now is just walk down the corridor and, and into the Edge Lab. So follow me here. Welcome. Thank you so much, uh, Kim, and uh, welcome to the uh, AI Sweden Edge Lab, which is part of our data factory test bed. Um, 
I am going to just give you a brief overview of the space and what we have in here. And then uh, Kim is going to uh, show you a uh, first implementation from one of our industry sector, the automotive sector of, of their implementation here. So by um, starting with the layout of the lab, what you can see here behind me primarily is our uh, collaboration space. We have uh, workspaces where engineers uh, from partner companies, students and others, uh, faculty researchers can come in and work in here. Uh, we have a small electrical workshop in the corner and we have a conferencing ability here in the middle where we can have local conferences but also connect up through the internet to, to uh, remote conferences to, to pretty much anywhere. Uh, looking over this side of the room, we have our infrastructure side uh, in here. We have our fully controllable back phone. Um, here we can uh, use software uh, and hardware, of course, but primarily software to set up any topology uh, that our partners want to do the experiments. We can set up any type of distributed machine learning ranging from um, large uh, sort of single servers all the way down to swarm learning in, in smaller devices. We have real communication in the space here provided by Ericsson. Um, it's um, uh, Wi-Fi, it's 4G and 5G connected through the local networks here in the building. Uh, HP is provided the backbone and the framework. And we have through this uh, center here, um, remote access as well through uh, VPN connections that would enable uh, research partners to connect in from their own sites, both here in Sweden and also globally if, if uh, desired. Our first application setup came from the automotive industry. That's also where the initiative came from together with the HP. Uh, we have had strong support uh, also from Vinova uh, to get this up and running. And as you can see, also CGIT has, has been a, a good contributor and are contributing more as we go forward here. And we also know several other partners coming in now in the, in the near future. Uh, our first application set up, as I said, from the automotive industry, and I'm going to have uh, uh, introduce uh, Kim Hendrickson from Zensact, who not only set up the automotive part, but has also be one of the key people uh, in setting up the entire um, Edge Lab. Here. So with that, um, I'd like to introduce Kim, who can give you a quick overview of what you can see here behind. Thank you, Mats. So from the automotive industry, we set this up in order to answer a set of questions. How do we do federated machine learning on the edge? What tools should we use? What frameworks work best for us? So we started to bring in a diverse set of industry grade hardware and prototype environments, as you can see behind me here. These we will run in various configurations, testing different use cases, fully leveraging the configurable backbone uh, to explore more about how we do this. So during the spring, we will expect to set up a series of projects to explore this further. Uh, our own colleague, Sophie Tressing, will present more thoughts on this topic later today. And with that, I hand it back to you, Mats. Thank you so much, Kim, and a fantastic job on, on you uh, and on uh, your colleagues here, not least you one from HP, Ola from uh, AI Sweden, Leo also from AI Sweden, um, and Johnny, who has been a key person also within uh, AI Sweden to set this up and get the design right. Um, as you could see, this was an automotive implementation. Uh, we are welcoming and looking forward to other industry sectors coming in here with their um, ideas and their equipment to work together and learn from us and we can learn from, from you set up. So, so this is all donated or on loan, I should say, from companies uh, to, to set this up and, and to work with. So you can set it up here or of course you can set it up at any of the other nodes in AI Sweden. As, and as you could see in Ebba's presentation earlier, we have all the way from the south to the north. So in summary, uh, we have now uh, the world's premier collaborative edge lab, perhaps the world's only as far as we know, as Anna was saying as well. Um, and uh, when discussing this with some colleagues in the last few days, we realized that we can think of this as a gym. And what we have done here is to put in the gym equipment and we can also bring in our own gym equipment. And the idea is to come here and train, train by yourself or train together to get stronger. And that is sort of the mindset we have. You get here and the value and your own strength, you develop yourself using what we have here and also contributing to it. So with that short summary and with that brief overview, I'd like to pass it on to the colleagues from HPE who can 
going to show you now a little bit about what can be done for real here as examples. And with that, I pass it over to, to uh, Peter and uh, Johan. Hi, everyone. Looks very nice, I have to say. Uh, can you hear me, please? Can I just get in? Can you hear and see? Yes, we can, Peter. Ah, perfect. Perfect. Thanks, Matt, and uh, thank you, Kim. Uh, I, I have to say it looks beautiful, <laughs> the lightning and everything. Um, so my name is Peter Vernoff. I'm the chief technologist of, of HP here in Sweden and, and the main contact for AI Sweden. And uh, I also have Johan von Dien, who is the solution architect, and he's working very closely to Kim and Ola and the guys, and he will uh, take over here in a couple of minutes in order to show what we have and what we can do. And, and as Anna stated before, I mean, if, if you take the gym analogy here, Mats, and it's really that we looking forward to be as a PT for all the partners going forward. We don't know everything, but we really looking forward to contribute. So what do we have? And I just want to start with something. Uh, some of you is much younger than me, and, and maybe you use the term fog computing. So getting that out of, of the way, I just want to say that edge computing and fog computing is, is essentially the same. At HPE, we talk about edge uh, to core to cloud, data processing, and pipelines. So, so uh, don't be alarmed if you hear fog computing or edge computing. It's just the same thing, and we can, we can do, do it all. And to, to the point that Mats has stated and everyone else, I mean, I, I, I can't comprehend how much data we are going to, to get from the edge, but we really, really need to be able to harness the, the, uh, the data that will be generated. Uh, and for Sweden, I, I mean, we need to be on top of this. And that's why we at HB are so uh, thrilled to be, be uh, partnering with you. So uh, what have we done and what were, are we looking uh, for in the edge lab? And this is just uh, uh, the sketch that you see before. So we have a bunch of edge, no edge nodes, uh, edge compute with GPUs. Uh, we have NVIDIA edge uh, devices in the lab as well. Uh, we have the core that you just saw from Mats uh, down in Gothenburg with uh, resources. Uh, we have the CGI T resources connected. We have uh, the rig from HP Stockholm that also has GPU uh, resources uh, when needed. And of course, we have the, the cloud providers. And, and as you can see, this looks very much as a real life scenario. And this complexity needs to be handled in some way. So we have spend some time in order to what is stated here as the cloud 2.0. It's actually a, a very, very capable management plane that will connect both data and compute. So you can look at it as, as a way for us to, to use all the different data sources that Eva talked about that has been donated. We don't need to move it. We can connect to it from any compute source and, and do it very efficiently. So as, as we say at the top here, we, efficiency for all, we really would like to enable all partners to use this environment in the most efficient way. And, and as Mats also stated, there could be more resources both at the edge uh, and Ericsson should be in this picture and so on. So we need to connect it. Uh, and that's why Yuan has prepared just a short a demo what what is uh, what we can do, and we can build out the capability of this environment uh, to the need of of uh, this community going forward. So we are thrilled. So um, I will stop uh, sharing and and hand it over to you, Juan. Thank you, Peter. Um, so I'll just start the sharing myself, and let's see if it works. That's assume it will okay good so um i'm going to get a bit more down to earth than peter and uh, mats has been about 
the edge lab and what we have done in there. Uh, the, there we are, there we are, good. So the ASML uh, platform has several components. Um, in the AI Sweden Edge Lab, um, the ASML container platform and the ASML data fabric are installed. Um, and the ML Ops is also actually installed, but it's not currently configured. And these are the two components I will speak about today. Um, the container platform is a highly available multi-tenant platform running um, Kubernetes-based workloads. As I will show in a demo later on here in a few minutes, an administrator in the Edge Lab can, can easily create and manage and delete Kubernetes clusters and users can create and manage their compute or GPU workloads. Um, the data fabric is the underlying glue which binds all our data together in the Edge Lab or if you will at a customer installation somewhere else. The data fabric has a global namespace, which means that data by any application anywhere can be securely accessed by any other applications anywhere if they require so. More on this subject later. Um, and um, yeah, there it was another little animation. So, um, when a project wants to conduct a test or demonstration of an ap application or, or run an AI workload of some kind, for example, they need infrastructure to run that on. Um, the HP SML uh, platform provides that to speed the project startup in the Edge Lab. The project doesn't have to bring or install their own Kubernetes clusters or to run their own, uh, to run their own workloads in, um, and nor do they need to bring in any storage to store their data. Uh, in the project tenant within the SML platform, they directly have access to both ephemeral container storage and persistent storage through the data fabric. We hope that this will really speed you know, the project onboarding process up uh, in the Edge Lab. So many projects may share the same physical hardware and they only manage their workload. And if they want to, they can also manage the Kubernetes namespace directly with cube control. But you know, it's not a requirement. Um, and the project can just bring their containers or stateful applications as well, actually, and get started. Uh, if a project creates data which could be valuable to another project workload, that data can be made securely available to them without actually moving the data. Uh, so um, this is just to emphasize that any application, regardless of, of the protocols it uses to access data, may store it in the data fabric. This also means that any other application using different protocols may access the same data. As you see, um, the data fabric supports many different data sources. Um, and I have illustrated how the data fabric uses the global namespace to store the data in the Edge Lab, just to give you a real world idea of what it does. Um, data fabric nodes and, and clusters could actually span countries and continents and scale to thousands of nodes and you know, extreme capabilities. But in the Edge Lab use case, of course, we are uh, using a smaller setup. So um, moving on to a demo, which I will improvise and, and change screens here. Give me a few seconds. So um, I will sort of conduct a brief demo of the container platform or the SPL platform and show you some of the sort of practical, practical benefits the Edge Lab will get from, from using the platform. Um, so this is the login page and it's the same for every user, regardless of if they're an administrator or a normal user. So, and the user I'm logging in with is a, is a normal user, so to speak. Uh, um, a normal uh, uh, user tenant or, or a work uh, sort of workload uh, user. So, um, dum dum, the Edge Lab demo devil, uh, or the real world demo devil. So, in the uh, first dashboard just, you know, it displays the uh, performance graphs for this user's workloads, right? So it's, it's usable for, for any user when they log in and, and see the status. In the top right here, the user can uh, download their uh, 
configuration files to access the Kubernetes clusters and manage his or her application. Um, the FS mounts view here, for example, it illustrates how we access the data fabric volumes that you know this uh, tenant and this user have access to. So you see the path here, which sort of uh, sees where you know this specific tenant stores their data. Um, uh, another tenant would, of course, you know, had an, had, have another, but you know, a similar path. And an admin could add more data tabs, as we call them, to this tenant. And I will show this uh, later on. Um, and then we have the most interesting part here, which is uh, the applications uh, uh, view. And here we have an application catalog for this tenant. I only have a few examples here, but um, out of the box, we, we have these four ones that I have enabled for the Edge Lab. But a user or an admin could easily add and publish their own applications here using the open source cube director tool available from HP. And this uh, sort of simplifies deployments and saves time since for tenant users. Um, you know, uh, let me just quickly click through a deployment to show you. So if I need a deployment, I'm just deploying a simple container here. So I get uh, the op uh, opportunity to modify my uh, deployment. Um, adding more resources, for example, and I just hit the submit button. Uh, and of course it fails because I have to change the name of the instance because I already have one deployed. So the demo, uh, let's call it two. And then we do submit. Okay. So now uh, I'm deploying my, my new tenant here or my new workload. Uh, so just to show you how easy it is to deploy a new workload for, for a user. Um, let me lo log in uh, or log out again, and I will log in as an administrator uh, instead to just show you how uh, we simplify for administrators to, um, to manage tenants and Kubernetes clusters. As you see here, I was uh, using the same login screen, but I'm directed to a completely different view uh, of the application when I log in as an administrator instead. This is the multi-tenancy part of, of, uh, of the platform. So going into the Kubernetes view, uh, which is the most important one for us, um, I see the tenants that I have created before. Uh, for example, in this case, I see the tenant that we were just recently logged into. And um, creating a new tenant is, you know, easy peasy. I can just click a create here. And if a new project is interested in going into the Edge Lab, um, um, I can just, um, you know, create it very quickly. And uh, I can, um, you know, add as many tenants to, the, to, to a Kubernetes cluster as I want, as long as there are resources available. And I can uh, set quotas if I need. If I leave them blank, they will be uh, without limit, right? So uh, I have to do a brief description as well. Two dots will do. And um, creating a tenant is now ready. So a new, now can, users can be assigned to this tenant and they can log in to the, to the web user interface and deploy uh, workloads. Um, so moving to the clusters um, section here, we can see that uh, I currently have um, two clusters deployed. Um, I can, for example, easily upgrade in cluster. You can see here that this is the version of Kubernetes I'm currently running. And if I want to upgrade Kubernetes to a newer version, I, uh, I have a drop down menu here and, and the newer versions available in the platform are, are listed here. Uh, and then I can select how large part of all the workers, for example, I can will update uh, simultaneously. Um, if I have in this normal use case, if I have four nodes, it will, or five nodes, or uh, it will update one node at a time, 20%, right? It's a default, but you can select your own. And uh, it's very easy. So uh, this makes it easy for, for administrators to manage their Kubernetes environments, right? Um, and creating, um, oh, okay, uh, let's see here. Um, 
So creating a, a new cluster is, is also very easy. It's, a, it's similar to editing a cluster, for example, where you can add or uh, um, remove nodes, for example. So creating a new cluster here, I just select a, a master node I want and a worker node. And I call it something and I do a description and I do next. And I have a few options here, of course, but you know, for this demo, I'll just leave them uh, in the default versions. And I don't have a director server at the moment in my, in my uh, environment, we use local accounts, but uh, you have the opportunity to integrate with Active Directory, for example, right? And it's, that means authentication becomes very easy. And I can uh, integrate with uh, Istio Service Mesh, for example, or, or use Spark operators. Um, submit. So now it's uh, installing a new cluster. So how, that's how easy it is to deploy a new Kubernetes cluster. Um, so um, the, the cluster is creating now. And uh, hopefully um, this is been, you know, has given you a, this small demo has given you at least an inkling of, you know, what our platform can do and how it will enable the Edge Lab to work smarter and, and, and faster. Thank you very much. That was all for me. Thank you, Yuan and Peter, and uh, a great demo. And as you can see here, it's uh, a good backbone. We uh, expect also, and we think that there are going to be several others who are going to come in and, and uh, set up different experiments now and, and work with us on this very exciting journey. Um, now, as we said, we're going to do some uh, sandbox examples, and uh, the idea of them are to go in here and, and show what we can explore and then try to learn from and then identify new larger projects. First out here is going to be Andreas Helande. He is from Scaleout Systems, and he's going to talk about an upcoming project in the Edge Lab where uh, companies uh, Scaleout and Peltorian are going to collaborate to set up a test bed for a, a federated natural language processing um, example um, using some of the solutions from Scaleout. So with that uh, introduction, over to you, Andreas. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for that. Uh, yes, so we are Scaleout Systems. We're one of the partners in the Federated Learning Test Bed project. Uh, and we're working uh, with Federated Learning. It's one of our key technologies um, and a big R&D focus of ours. Um, and Federated Learning, uh, is simple in concept. It promises essentially that by uh, coordinating model updates from multiple, potentially many thousands of clients um, in, a, in a clever way, uh, in an iterative fashion, uh, we're going to be able to train uh, state-of-the-art machine learning models without centralizing or pooling data sets. So this opens up for um, for partners to collaborate um, on building models uh, or, and also for devices then to in, in edge situations to, um, to work in a federated setting. Uh, so this is what we're doing. Uh, we are developing a technology, a, a open source project uh, um, for doing this um, um, that we're doing then together with partners as well, uh, exploring use cases in this project. Um, so one a couple of sort of features of our solution then is that we have a hierarchical architecture. So we, we are trying to make a system that is very highly scalable so we can support thousands of clients in a, in a federation in production. Um, we also try to make a machine learning framework agnostic design. Uh, and, and for this, the uh, partnership and, and this project that we're involved in with AI Sweden has been very helpful because we get exposed to very many different types of of models from, from data scientists across these projects. Um, our solution, we, we want it to be able to handle both what is called cross silo and cross device use cases. We have focused mostly on cross silo in early applications. Uh, and the difference here is that it's essentially one of size and scale. Uh, so typically in cross silo, we're looking at maybe fewer clients, uh, but large models and large data sets. In cross device, we're looking at very many clients, edge devices. Uh, and potentially smaller updates. Um, so this is what we're doing. Um, one of the key challenges uh, in federated learning is that of system heterogeneity. Uh, and this is quite obvious if you think about it. So uh, there will be a large variation in clients 
both update speeds and reliability in such a federation due to a great deal of system and hardware heterogeneity, uh, network latency, what kind of, of uh, GPUs do you have and so forth. Um, and this is a very interesting aspect of the algorithm development when it comes to federated learning um, and a very active area of research. Uh, so we, what we do today uh, when we look at these questions and others is, is often that we leverage traditional cloud environments. Um, we, we start hundreds or thousands of clients then and we, we sort of emulate this, this system heterogeneity. Uh, this is a very convenient way to do experimentation, uh, but to get further, uh, we now plan to uh, leverage the work done in Edge Lab and actually do this on real hardware and real devices and sort of take these studies to a, a higher level of, of realism. And this we will do in this project together with Peltarion uh, and potentially other partners as well. So we're going to look at uh, state-of-the-art natural language processing models developed by, by Peltarion's great team uh, and deploy them with FedN um, and see sort of what we find, uh, what are the costs and constraints of using uh, real edge setups. So thank you. Thank you very much, Andreas. That's great to hear. And we will actually hear some uh, info from Peltari on another use case that they are uh, working on in the data factory as we speak. Uh, but now we will also see if we have Chital with us, our data scientist with the data factory team. Hi, Chital. Hi. Can Hi, you Max. present uh, your use case, please? Yeah, sure. Uh, hi, uh, I'll introduce myself first, everyone. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Shital Reddy. I work as a data scientist uh, at AI Sweden. And uh, today I'm here to talk about how to get started uh, easily uh, with federated learning. So as everyone know, uh, machine learning uh, is constantly evolving. And as a data scientist, I feel it is very important uh, to get started uh, uh, easily with the latest upcoming techniques and technologies in machine learning for the data scientists. So I'm here uh, to talk about how uh, my journey and how I started out uh, uh, with uh, federated learning. Uh, like Andreas explained before, uh, it's a very simple topic. Uh, federated machine learning, it's, it's a machine learning setting where clients train on uh, their local data sets and then they share these insights with a central server which aggregates these models and sends back uh, to the clients. And this is an iterative process. Federated learning systems uh, can be classified broadly into uh, six types uh, based on uh, machine learning models that they use or the scale of federation. So the, the six types that you see uh, on the picture uh, in the slide. So it, it's a very broad topic, but how do you get started in such a broad topic? So like in every other uh, machine learning uh, uh, techniques or machine learning areas, we get started with the hello world of machine learning, which is the MNIST data set. And so we did the same as well. Uh, from the MNIST data set and uh, applying it in a federated learning setting, I have realized that uh, federated learning works well for IID distributions, but in non-IID distributions, like you see in the second example here, it doesn't uh, really work uh, that well. So, so, okay, now we have taken the first step of implementing it on a very simple data set, but how do we move forward and uh, implement it uh, or scale it uh, uh, or develop applied uh, scalable uh, federated learning systems? We have done uh, some survey of the open source frameworks that are actually available uh, right now uh, uh, there, there are PySeft, FATE, Padlefl, and TensorFlow uh, Federated. And we have done a simple comparison and survey around the available open source frameworks for federated learning. Uh, every framework that is available has its own pros and cons, but there is no framework which can actually be uh, taken out of the box and used for more experimentation. Uh, these are the pros and cons that you see. Uh, some of them only work with a specific DL framework like Paddle FL works with only Paddle, Paddle uh, DL framework. And uh, PySift is very much uh, interesting for, uh, for privacy preserving techniques, but 
vertical federated learning is not yet implemented. All these frameworks are work in progress. Now, how do how do we move forward then uh, uh, to uh, to actually get started with federated learning? So we. Uh, at AI Sweden have decided uh, to have some sandbox use cases, uh, like one of it is Fedbird, uh, to be made available as part of the edge lab, the code, the learnings, uh, the documentation, everything, so that people can come and uh, 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 take the code, uh, take the Ansible playbooks, and then deploy them, and then uh, get started with federated learning soon. So uh, as part of the Fedbird uh, project that we are doing, uh, we have the Seabird data set, uh, which is around 2,300 samples. Now we have uh, thought of having a more complex, uh, uh, complex use case that is object detection instead of uh, image recognition on a very simple data set like MNIST. So the data set that we have uh, has three classes annotated, an adult bird, chick, and egg. The data set itself uh, is, uh, very complicated because of the uh, unbalanced uh, classes it has. And then uh, to replicate a real world scenario, we thought we would have uh, two camera views in the data set uh, as two different clients. So we consider two different ledges as two different clients. And these two different clients are also non uh, id uh, distributions. So uh, it can be uh, a challenging data set to work with and uh, 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 a gamification sort of thing to actually get more accuracy. So uh, a really good thing to get started with this data set is what we thought. The infrastructure that we are going to deploy this uh, is part of the Edge Lab, where we have two clients and one central server. Now, because we have only two ledges uh, annotated, we are adding more and more ledges for uh, uh, scalability. Currently, we are using Scaleout's Fedin as a communication layer. And this, uh, uh, this code will be deployed on the edge devices available at Edge Lab. Uh, for example, the resource constrained edge dividers at Xavier, which are already available at Edge Lab. Uh, it is not just a sandbox POC where people can uh, come in and uh, play with it, but the learnings of the Fedbird project will actually go into uh, the Hello China POC. Hello China POC is uh, part of the Fed Federated Learning Testbed uh, actually at AI Sweden, uh, proposed by Zensact. So in Hello China POC, where uh, uh, Zensact was having a problem uh, uh, with uh, transporting the data set, the raw data from China, and they wanted to use federated learning to actually bring in insights from uh, the China uh, data set and also the Sweden data set and aggregate it at a central server. So China, the Hello China POC also needs object detection and segmentation uh, use case. So the code and also the learnings from the Fedbird would be perfect and uh, to be uh, extended for the Hello China POC. We have already uploaded parts of our code in our GitHub repo and uh, in the coming weeks we'll update the documentation with the Ansible playbooks uh, so that you could use it. So watch out our uh, GitHub space uh, for more information uh, and we would be also able to deploy uh, the code uh, in the Edge lab uh, in the coming weeks soon. So with that I, uh, I hand it back to uh, Eba. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Shital. Um, an excellent example. And for all of you who are watching, uh, this uh, Seber data set was donated to us from the Swedish Agricultural University, SLU. And it's available uh, to all partners here to do their own experiments as well. Uh, next um, presentation is going to be from one of my colleagues here and on the automotive side, uh, Sophie Tressing from Sansac. She is uh, conducting some really cutting edge uh, work uh, within uh, the Volvo Cars and Sansact um, sphere. So over to you, Sophie. Thank you. Uh, let's see here. Hey everyone, I mean, the Edge Lab looks super impressive and the configuration of it is really impressive. So really looking forward to using this environment for our use cases. Uh, hopefully you can see my screen now and with, with my presentation as well. Yes. Good. Yes. Okay, so my name is uh, Sophie Tressing. I'm the product owner for a product called Fleet Insight. Um, and it's all about being able to get insights and learnings from the fleet. So basically learning in the edge 
and to use those insights for developing our future products within SenseAct. Uh, and just very short about SenseAct. So we are developing a software platform to enable safe AD and ADAS together with our partners, but also as Volvo Cars as a lead customer. And what we are doing is that we are uh, processing dense uh, data coming into our software stack. We are making decisions and then making sure that the car is uh, um, driving safely. And in order to have this as a living product over time, we need to have access to our customer fleet because we need to get continuous insights and we need to be able to adapt our functions to be um, compatible to the dynamic world we are living in. Uh, and for this matter, um, Edge Lab is gonna be super important for us both get confidence in the roadmap that we are building, the features that we have foresee coming, and also how we can be very efficient in the software development, which for us is very, very data-driven. Um, so we want to move to edge. We want to mo make most of the insights and analytics closer to the edge, um, instead of bringing data off the vehicle. We want to do this as, as efficient as we can. Um, so just confirming, basically what we have said today i mean the edge lab is going to be a super important environment and uh, i'm a happy user and hopefully a, a contributor as well uh, but we are seeing that we have a possibility to benchmark different hardware and software even tools and different techniques uh, we can be familiar with the latest and greatest software and hardware that is on the market today we can try out our innovative ideas and this before we actually deploying this to the vehicle. So we can try out if this is something that we want to deploy to the vehicle before we actually operate in that. Um, we want to have, we're going to have a hub for interaction with our partners, but also research, uh, have a platform for engaging with students about this topic. We're going to have a community with a lot of knowledge in this area. Um, and we're also going to see if we can find synergies and brainstorming around this topic. And I mean, and, and one really big thing about this environment for us is that it's connected to Odin, which is our uh, data center together with HPE that hosts several petabytes of data and a lot of uh, compute servers. And this is the environment where we're actually going to develop ADNA that's in the future. Um, and this is also the environment where we're going to have the fleet data coming in from our customer vehicles. So the insights that we are um, gaining from our edge learnings. So we're going to use this environment to make our ideas real. Um, so just go into some use cases. Um, I mean, we're going to have this environment as a common uh, environment for, for Sensex and Volvo cars to build up the insight as a product, but also see uh, the, um, the roadmap going ahead. And just to mention some use cases that we're gonna have. One is related to safety validation methods. So how can we ensure that we're gonna have a safe product at customers? And for this matter, we want to try out different prediction models, like uh, to model our uh, expectations on how the car should behave and identify when it behaves differently. We want to be able to identify sen sensor inconsistency and also this using machine learning techniques. Um, we want to be able to do scale up cases. So how can we operate on a larger scale? Like how can we include many different edges and how can we find conclusions? For example, in our case, different regions using machine learnings. And I mean, this list is gonna be long. Um, so we're really looking forward to, to use this environment. Um, and we already yesterday tried to log into HB MRL uh, platform. So uh, I'm excited. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Sophie. Great to hear that you're already, you're already onto it. And uh, perfect that you're also mentioning all of this about the how to uh, scale this and be able to see if you can split up to different regions. What do you say, Mats? Yeah, I think it's important for everybody here to realize that AI Sweden is a national uh, center for AI with uh, presence at our different nodes. And what you've seen today is what we've our first instance and, and what we put in together. But for you who are everywhere else in the country or elsewhere, you can connect in remotely, as we said before, but you can also set up your own equipment at a node that's closer to you if you want. And that will also enable us to do geographically distributed or regional distributed 
experiments, just like Sophie was, was mentioning here. So think of it as a national resource, national access, setting up at a place that's convenient to you. Truly on the edge. Definitely on the edge. Mm -hmm. And, and we look forward to all sort of initiatives uh, and all sort of um, experiments here. And what we foresee is that in the beginning now we'll, we'll train and we'll, we'll learn how to use this equipment and that will identify bigger initiatives that we can run. And then we'll form joint projects around them, several different organizations, companies, universities, whatever, and then drive them as a sort of a, a more focused project. So both the sandbox where we learn and figure out the problems and then a place to, to run our, our innovation projects. That's great. Yeah. Um, so that was the opening of the Edge Lab. We're very excited to see all of you partners come in and join and see what you can do out of this. Yes. Really take us up on that. And uh, feel free to contact pa Mats or me uh, or you want for, for example, from uh, HPE specifically for some Edge Lab questions as well. Um, and then now we're actually taking a short break. And after the break, you will see some use cases of uh, what the data factory in general is being used for today and also some ML ops um, systems. So that's going to be very exciting. We would like to see you back here at 10 past 10. So you've got about five minutes now to refill your coffee cups and stretch a little bit. Right. And we'll see you in five minutes. But Thank you so much. And, okay. And we're back. We're back after the great opening of the Edge Lab. Very exciting to hear what's going to happen in there. And we look forward to uh, finding out what other new projects we can find for the Edge Lab. Yeah, there will be projects and there will also be uh, a lot of more coverage on the Edge Lab and what is possible. Uh, among other things, there's two new uh, news articles out in Swedish media today about the Edge Lab. Uh, so there will be an interest uh, from the industry, we know there will be an interest from the industry and also hopefully from uh, academia. Uh, so if you're interested to learn more and to engage, please be sure to reach out. You can write us here in the chat and you can email Ebba because she's the, the master of answering emails as well. Uh, and Ebba, I've also heard that there will be a new kind of series from the Edge Lab with a podcast where you will interview uh, people. Of course, Ebba on the Edge. Ebba on the Edge, right? exactly. Come out. Coming up, stay tuned for, for that podcast. <laughs> we will also need you, Peter, to, to make that available, but definitely that's one way to make sure it's all over Sweden yeah. uh, and goes national. Yeah. So really remember, uh, wherever you are, uh, you can really get access to the Edge Lab and please feel free to set up nodes at our other nodes or our other locations. That just excites it even more. Exactly. And now we're moving on in the agenda or in the program. Exactly. Taking a bit more focus of uh, the full data factory concept. And now first we will look a little bit into the ML ops of it, and then we'll see some use cases of what's going on in the data factory as we speak. Uh, but first we'll start with uh, welcoming back CGIT and this time Petter. And then we have Simon with us as well, I think. Okay, great. Can you hear me? Yes, perfect. 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 Okay. So, so thank you very much. So uh, we at CGIT, we are very happy and proud to have been part of AI Sweden since the start, almost two years ago, uh, delivering expertise and powering the very heart of the data factory. Uh, now we are excited to announce a new evolutionary step for our company. So the CGIT and asymptotic joint venture, Aixia, that will be uh, made public today. Uh, we will offer ML operations solutions to companies and organizations working with AI. First tools to be offered through IXIA is IQ and SnapXS. So IQ is an advanced scheduler specifically developed for AI workloads that will drastically reduce complexity when planning and using valuable compute resources. And uh, this will, of course, increase efficiency and make daily life a lot easier for deep learning teams and IT organizations alike. SnapXS is a data management software suite that enables efficient use of big data in AI ecosystems. It provides easy access to petabytes of data and its annotations. 
It enables easy search, filter, and data sharing with only a few lines of code. SnapXS will significantly increase the data-related return of investment by maximizing the value of data and reducing the development cost and shortening the time of production. So together, SnapXS and IQ offers a turnkey solution. As my colleagues talked about earlier, turnkey is really uh, an important word here. So we offer turnkey solutions to give you a head start in your AI development. And we are very excited to be the first Swedish company to offer a complete and proven AI infrastructure solution and ML ops platform, both as a service or on premise. And as a partner to AI Sweden, you will be among the first to be able to try out these great new tools. Uh, so before I leave you with Simon Janek and Yinan Yu, who will explain more about IQ and Snap Access, I just wanted to let you know that CGIT have also placed a brand new water-cooled, super quiet, super computer equipped with the latest A100 GPUs from NVIDIA in the Edge Lab uh, at AI Sweden. So be so sure to check that out when you visit the next time. And with that, I hand over to Simon and Jinan. Hi, my name is Simon and this is What is IQ? Uh, so IQ is a resource and uh, AI scheduler, um, specifically made for AI research and digitalization optimization. Uh, so it will simplify your operations uh, and management of uh, queuing jobs and maintaining um, workloads on your uh, AI infrastructure. Um, IQ uh, will be installed on um, AI Sweden's um, data factory very soon. Uh, it will be available for all the partners and users of the data factory which is very exciting, and we hope to get feedback on that. Um, so AQ is also a completely REST API-based system, so everything it does is REST API-based first. So if you want to include it in your, in your own tool chain in any way, that's entirely possible. Um, so I have written here on the left a, a short list of what we consider a scheduler to be in its bare form. So it's a, it's a piece of software that accepts jobs, it puts jobs in a queue, it executes the jobs from the queue, and it has some level of prioritization in the queue. Um, so what we've added to this to make our uh, piece of software uh, very special to us uh, is that we've added management in several layers. So we've added management features. Um, and the first management piece of um, uh, infrastructure we've added is a user management platform. So we can maintain users. Um, and have them in the database for, for uh, adding and removing and, and keeping track of. Uh, and this is also entirely possible to integrate with external uh, authentication, such as LDAP or, or, um, uh, or other external authentication. Uh, we've added a project um, function, uh, so we can set up projects and assign users to projects. Um, um, and this will allow them to, to share resources in some sense. So they can collaborate on data, they can, uh, they can share the same token system, some sort. Uh, we've added a registry feature, uh, and the registry is responsible for, uh, registry, uh, for maintaining um, images uh, of your system. So you can have your own personalized images um, and don't need to uh, rely on external sources for those, uh, for the entire system. Uh, and then we've also added a data management uh, uh, path. Um, uh, and we would have added quite a, a robust feature inside uh, IQ itself, but we'll also partner up with uh, Asymptotic in a joint venture um, to bring their Snap XS platform um, to our, um, uh, or to a, a joint um, interface where you can collaborate and make sure the data is, uh, is available. And this brings very advanced data management features, and we're very excited for that collaboration. Uh, and will also be uh, discussed further uh, by you now later. Um, the, the last part here is the token management system. Um, so we've added a token system, uh, and the token system is responsible for, for when you execute a job, it will withdraw points from your token system. And that is mainly so you have or can prioritize different kind of hardware for different kind of operations. Uh, so if you have very um, expensive hardware, you might want to keep those busy with uh, a certain type of job. Um, and we also heavily extended the prioritization uh, feature. So we've built an advanced prioritization uh, feature, which will make sure that the users um, 
uh, with, with the highest priority, uh, get their jobs executed first. And you can move stuff up and down in the queue to make sure that everything is uh, executed as you would like to. Um, so this is uh, a short list of what IQ does. Um, there's more resources available if you want to dig deeper uh, or contact us for me more details. Um, and now for me here, you and I will talk a little bit about uh, Snap Access and uh, the joint venture between CJT and, and uh, Asymptotic. Thank you. Hi, my name is Yinan. I'm the Chief Product Officer at Asymptotic AI. We're very excited to start Axia together with CGIT. Today, I will give a brief introduction to our big data management system, Snap Access. Finding value in data is like hunting for the most rare mushroom in a huge forest. It's frustrating, it's time consuming, but you will be well rewarded when you finally find the rare mushroom. Snap Access is designed to maximize this reward without the pain. Let's start with the four types of data that might be lying around on your storage. You have your legacy data. These are the data sets you've collected long time ago. They are stored in a dusty old storage room, costing money, and no one knows how to access them anymore. There's also the historic data. This is the data being collected over time. You want to have easy access to it and be able to search for exactly what you need from this growing data pool. Another type of data is the active data collection. Collected data come from your edge devices and they go into your central storage system. These data sets reflect the latest specifications and use cases. In order to ensure the quality of the data collection, this data set often needs to be iterated upon. The last type of data is the core data set for deep learning training and validation or other types of analysis. You want to be able to conveniently curate your core data set from any data sources without having to duplicate them. These data sets are distributed on different servers, computers, hard drives, or even USB keys with completely different ways of access. While what you want is to browse, analyze, and process your data on a laptop or a central computing node in an easy and unified way. This is not a trivial task. When you get started, you realize that it's nearly impossible to find any interesting mushroom in this massive data forest. This is where Snap Access comes to the rescue. With its smart scaling technology, Snap Access allows you to have access to different data sources with only a few lines of code in your favorite programming language. You can also visualize any data you want in the web browser. It also connects your data to the deep learning training process for efficient development. Snap Access consists of a core component and three satellite modules, the annotation module, the deep learning module, and the application module. Snap Access Core is the backend of the data search engine. The annotation module enables advanced search and provides annotations for deep learning training and validation. The deep learning module is designed for algorithm development and deployment of your AI product, including functionalities such as hyperparameter tuning. The application module provides additional services and plugins like data anonymization and web interfaces. You can also build your own plugins specific to your use case. SnapAccess runs as a service or on your premises. It's very lightweight, which makes it suitable to run even on edge devices. Together with IQ from CGIT, SnapAccess will offer an end-to-end -end AI ecosystem using minimal resources, which provides you with an efficient and exciting AI experience. So, Peter. This is really, really cool stuff that you are now uh, getting into the data factory and which will be available to, da to uh, data factory users and our partners in a very short while, sometime February, right? Yes, yes, absolutely. So it's, we are very excited to be doing this and it's, uh, it's a whole new experience for us to work with uh, uh, ML operations uh, in, in this way. So uh, yeah, we're looking forward to collaborate with AI Sweden and all the partners to uh, with us yeah 
And we really appreciate that you picked this occasion to share these big news. So that's really great. Thank you Thank so you. much. And you will be staying on line for a little bit more. And Simon is there as well. If anybody has any questions, use the Q&A tab and write it. And uh, Petter and Simon can uh, respond right away. Yep. So thank you so much, Peter. Thank you, Simon. And uh, now we'll head into one of our use cases of what's going on in the data factory. And we have with us uh, Paul Blomgren Dovan and uh, John Harrison from Gothenburg Film Studios. How are you guys? Yes, we're fine. Thank you so much. So we're really excited about seeing uh, what progress you have been doing on working on the data factory. Um, Jon, you've been doing the algorithm training, uh, both on the older equipment that we had, the DGX1, and now you're working on the A100. So uh, please go ahead and we will help you share the film clip. So just let us know when we, when we should start. Thank you. Thank you for giving us the uh, opportunity to present our work uh, a little bit. Uh, my name is Paul. Um, I'm a producer at Gothenburg Film Studios and uh, Göta Film, which are uh, two brands uh, of the same family. And we provide various services for uh, the film industry, both locally here in Sweden and uh, abroad. Uh, we also develop uh, content uh, for both screen and, and TV. Um, and uh, currently uh, we are exploring and developing the use of AI within traditional filmmaking. So uh, today we can uh, just briefly describe an early project uh, resulting from this work, which is a short film called Grab Them. Uh, it premiered about a year ago at Göteborg Film Festival and currently you can all watch it, uh, at least in Sweden, on the SVT Play. So uh, this is a story about a middle-aged woman named Sally and uh, <clears throat> it's offering a rather satirical critique, I guess, on current chauvinistic tendencies in society. Uh, but with this project, we were also able to comment uh, on some of the consequences of the rapid technological development and possibly also provoke some thoughts and discussions uh, around the increased need that we feel at least uh, to adopt a critical stance to what we see and what we hear in various forms of media. Um, and uh, after establishing uh, an initial collaboration with AI Sweden, uh, we were able to develop ways to expand on uh, previously known deep fake techniques uh, in order to reach a quality level that were more suitable for professional filmmaking and we were aiming at screening in 2K resolution at uh, cinema theaters. Um, and we managed to do that. And now a year later, we are still conducting further testing here with the uh, AI Sweden uh, and the data factory to develop entirely new digital tools to uh, expand on the possibilities of filmmaking. Um, and uh, based on the experiences and, and knowledge we have gained this far, um, we see uh, a huge potential to establish new and uh, quite attractive tools, uh, scalable services uh, on an international market. Um, and we are currently looking for partners uh, and investors who would like to join us on, on this journey. But uh, before John uh, takes over, uh, just uh, we wanted to show a brief clip from the film uh, for you to uh, uh, get a feel for what we're doing. And uh, here we meet our main character, Sally, a middle-aged Swedish lady uh, with the misfortune to have a very striking resemblance of a former US president. And the later part of this very short clip is uh, a dream section where she is uh, daydreaming about uh, meeting a soulmate. So yeah, please play the clip.
My name is John. I have a background in mathematics and uh, I was part of uh, the Grab Them project about a year ago. And I'm also part of these new, uh, more uh, research and development uh, projects trying to streamline the uh, so called deep faking process um, to, uh, to better work with professional film. Uh, in both these cases, a year ago and now, as Paul already mentioned, we had. Uh, well, the data factory and the, and the hardware that it provided was uh, essential to, to make it work as we wanted it to work. There are uh, some different criteria in professional film uh, compared to what Deepfake was originally, the software was, was uh, uh, adapted to originally. And uh, I'll try to talk a little bit more of that and, and um, our results in the data factory, what we saw a year ago in comparison to what we see now in our newer tests. Uh, I'm quickly just going to go through the deep fake process and we're going to run a clip uh, after that where you can see uh, before and after uh, uh, the, the process is done. Um, the process uh, essentially you want to superimpose one face on top of another. Uh, it's not really a superimposition. It's, it's uh, you train a, a neural network uh, to, to predict uh, the, the face of one person onto the facial features uh, of another. So uh, uh, essentially the process is, is divided into three main parts. It's the extraction part, the training part, and the conversion part. Uh, the extraction part is where you extract the face, you, uh, you uh, find landmarks in the face and in the separate images. You try to align those landmarks between the images to get a smooth uh, transition in order to, for it to work in a film. Uh, and then you uh, extract a, a mask from those landmarks, uh, which, uh, which you train on. Uh, and then the training process, of course, that's where we use the data factory. You train a, a, a neural network uh, to um, <clears throat> predict these uh, two faces and then uh, 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 superimpose them or, or predict one face on top of another, you could say. And then the conversion part is, of course, when you take this model that you have trained and uh, you, uh, you do the superimpo superimposition of the trained face, the predicted face on top of the original image. Um, and uh, the difference uh, between uh, how the software was originally written and what we required was that in professional films, as Paul said, we want to have a very high quality image. Uh, to be able to screen it on, on, on cinema. And for this, uh, we required to train the models with uh, a very uh, high resolution. Uh, we want to train it with um, in a lot of uh, dimensions uh, on the uh, encoders and decoders uh, to be able to uh, make the face, uh, like uh, learn as many facial features as possible, even small things. To, to make it look as realistic as possible. Um, <clears throat> and uh, for this, we required very, very good hardware, uh, which the data factory provided us with, uh, the former DGX1 uh, that we used, um, made it possible for us to create uh, the grab them film in a, in a reasonable standard that, uh, that we wanted. You could see that there was still some limitations to it, but, um, it was working uh, and it was at that point uh, uh, the highest uh, level of, of, uh, of it uh, as far as I know uh, and could find in the world thanks to these, uh, this hardware. Uh, now in the process um, of uh, researching and developing this we have been testing again on the new A100 card and um, it is significantly uh, more powerful than the last one in the DGX1, uh, we can train it in much higher resolution uh, with more uh, dimension uh, and uh, the speed when I benchmarked it, we can train it in about four times as fast. So the training of, uh, of, of the grab them um, uh, film, the, that process took about a month and uh, I was now able to do the same, uh, get to the same amount of, of training, so to speak, of quality. Uh, in uh, in only a week, so a significant improvement uh, from before. Um, 
Yeah, I think uh, I'll leave it to uh, to some questions there too, in case people have it. Uh, but safe to say that the uh, the data factory has been very useful to us and continues to be useful to us also now in the in the development process, uh, where we will try to develop it to streamline even more to professional film, and um, in those cases, uh, this type of hardware is required uh, to reach the quality that we want. Oh, and uh, to see uh, to see this, we can also roll the film now, perhaps uh, just to get a before and after shot uh, uh, here. Okay, um, I think uh, I had a question there. Maybe I, I can take that right now. Uh, yes, sure, please. Please read out the question as well. Right, so in developing these tools, are there risks associated with, for example, facial recognition applications and the like? Um, I assume this means risks in terms of uh, ethical uh, or legal risks and so on. Um, the what I can say is the facial uh, recognition uh, process is part of the of the um, well, part of the whole process. Uh, you can of course use whatever facial recognition you want. Um, for this, we use the S3FD facial uh, recognition uh, process. Uh, it's um, for those for those who know it. But uh, you can, uh, if you want to use different ones, maybe you need a specific one for for uh, to extract specific faces. You can of course. Uh, Right, right code for that. The software is it's open source and it's developed in a very way so you can, it's, it's module based, you can say. So if there's a specific part you want to exchange or so on, you, you can do so, uh, write your own uh, and anything. Uh, in terms of the legal problems and so on, I don't think I'm the right person uh, to, to answer it, but uh, um, yeah. The the just in general of the of the extraction thing is that you you can use your own whatever you like uh, to do that. Yeah. Thank you so much, John. And um, I maybe we can bring up that question we, with Lynn from Max Law Firm when we go into the legal uh, part of this uh, webinar later today. Uh, but it is interesting questions, and I agree with uh, Victor. This is really so cool and. Could you just shortly say if there would be any other use cases where you could use a model like this, but in a total different setting, for example? Uh, well, yeah, um, you could, uh, like the, the neural network is a pretty general uh, neural network, so you can use it in all kinds of image processing, uh, probably also uh, text to, uh, to speech, uh, text recognitions and, uh, uh, and so on. And you can, of course, adapt different parts of it uh, to, to use for, like to specify for your needs, um, so uh, so yeah, there, there's uh, more than I can mention, I believe, uh, things and uh, and there's many sub parts of it. There's uh, uh, the base style that works where you, you incorporate the surroundings and so on, and uh, uh, you can add on any kind of layers in the network you need or or write yourself or figure out. Or, um, so there's uh, there's very many everything almost <laughs> you can think of you can probably make it happen. Thank you so much. I think that's really inspiring to to send out to partners that 
there's a lot of things going on here and you see one use case first for one model and then you realize it could be used for so many different things. Yeah. So thank you so much, Paul and John. Uh, I think you will be staying on just for a little bit more. If someone else wants to shoot a question in the Q&A, uh, they will be able to answer. Uh, but also stay tuned because uh, I think we will uh, eventually also show some more of the progress that you've made uh, from this project that you run in the data factory now. So we'll uh, make sure to make some posts on the website going forward, for example. So thank you guys so much for presenting this. Thank you. And then we'll head on to the next use case. Yes. Um, well, this is one of our founding partners now mm -hmm. uh, with Peltarion, who's they're doing a lot within image, but they're also doing a lot within text. So they're really one of our most active partners. And uh, we will be connecting uh, with uh, Agrin there. So we'll see if he's online. I think so. I've seen him. <laughs> I think I am. Hey, guys. Good to see you. <laughs> Hi, Green. Good to see you. And you've actually taken the opportunity to use the Data Factory for uh, now two different projects uh, connected to that's federated right. learning. So that's really cool. And um, please go ahead and, and show us some of the results from this last training that you're actually doing right now. All right. So let me go ahead and share my screen. It Good. looks yeah. great. Awesome. Okay. So <clears throat> just to give you like uh, a few seconds about what I'll be talking about. So as you mentioned, we've been working with multiple different use cases. Um, here, we're looking at sort of data efficiency and how efficiently can we create uh, labeled data? So I'm sure uh, many people here are very familiar with uh, sort of uh, these more recent like large language models, things like BERT. And you probably know that um, to get them to uh, solve a particular end application, I'll call it a task throughout this, uh, you, you tend to need uh, a data set um, that is uh, containing some type of labels, right? But, but nothing strange so far. And we know that uh, how good your data set is uh, reflects a lot in the uh, end performance of the model. So it's very important to have uh, good data. And sometimes you can get really, really nice public data sets. And you might be able to sort of uh, mash them together to create something uh, that is useful for your, your sort of end application. Uh, but many other times uh, you don't have that luxury. Um, uh, and that's sort of the situation we're gonna be talking about uh, now. Um, so in that situation, you need human annotators um, to assign labels. They need to look through the data and assign a label to each of them. Uh, and it, then the question might arise, so what is the most efficient way sort of to uh, to assign these labels? Are, are all data points equally important to assign labels to? Um, and the answer is no, uh, actually. So let, let's go to the next slide, yeah. Uh, so th there are many different methods uh, to handle scenarios like this where, where you try to annotate a lot of your data. Um, this is uh, a figure from one of them called Start Active Learning. It's a method called ALPS. And here you can see as you increase the number of labeled se sequences, how does that sort of reflect on the performance of the model? And uh, we're not gonna look through everything in this picture, but you can first look for the purple line, the sort of this line going through the data, uh, which reflects to just randomly picking labels and training your model, and then seeing how, how much uh, data do I need to get uh, a certain level of performance. And you can compare that to one of these brighter, more recent methods for sampling or acquiring uh, data. And you see that there's actually a pretty big difference. So these methods, there are methods that are much better than just randomly picking samples. And that's the type of methods we're going to be talking about today. It's called active learning in general. Um, you, you can, uh, in a very like simplified manner, you might think of it uh, as something like a process that looks like this. You have some type of model, you have some type of data, it doesn't have labels, and you want to get labels. So you want to sort of funnel it, uh, select the ones that are most important, so you get as good performance as quickly as possible, because this is a very costly process of using human annotators. It's very difficult to get it right. Um, you select a few, and you label your, uh, uh, you assign labels to them. And then you might do this iteratively, for example. So you might uh, retrain the model on, on this labeled subset. 
but as you know, um, large language models, uh, a really good thing they have is uh, what's called a pre-trained model. Uh, so these are um, the same model essentially, uh, but trained on a language modeling task. Um, and you probably know that you can take this model and sort of fine tune it on a different task. So you might imagine that the extension of active learning here uh, for a large language model is something like this, where you just simply start from a pre-trained language model, and then you start going through this loop of labeling up your data set and training your model iteratively and selecting samples based on what the model thinks uh, should be labeled. Um, th this might work, uh, but it, it also has a few different problems. Um, so one perhaps uh, very important one is the fact that um, often the pre-trained models uh, are very unstable uh, with respect to small data sets. Um, and as you see here, I mean, if you uh, start by creating your data set, you probably have a very small data set to begin with. Uh, so the model performance would probably not be very good and it will be hard to tell which samples are important. There are some recent fixes. Um, this is again uh, from the figure that I shared earlier. So the method called ALPS, uh, it's this paper, um, they propose using the uh, MLM task. So a language modeling uh, task and you, deriving metrics from that to sort of tell where the model is surprised uh, and so on. And that's a really promising direction. Uh, but another potential direction, which is what we're looking at here, is can we use uh, data sets for the same task, but in a different language? Uh, so what we're looking at, uh, and this is the research project that we're doing uh, in the data factory, uh, is starting off from a pre-trained model and then looking at uh, fine tuning it on uh, various types of uh, data sets that are for the same task, but in a different language, and then applying this uh, to learn the task and more efficiently label up uh, the data for the task in Swedish, for example. So th this is what we're looking into. Um, we are just getting started. Um, the scenario we're sort of looking at first here is uh, natural language inference. You know, you have two, uh, two sentences, pairs of sentences, and you look at the relationship between them and you classify into uh, three different labels. So we're looking at the data set X and the line. Uh, and we're using XLMR large, so a big Roberta version. And th these are pretty big data sets and the model itself is, is big. Uh, it, it's not easy to uh, train it on XNLI. So, so we've looked at sort of what is the uh, benefit for us from using the data factory and it's massive. Um, I mean, this is not a fair comparison. We have a previous generation GPU that we tried running one epoch of uh, MNLI. Um, on one of our own GPUs. We see it takes around seven hours. Um, and then, I mean, again, not fair comparison, but we compared to using four A100 GPUs, which is our allocation currently in the data factory. We see that it takes four minutes and 30 seconds. Uh, so it, it is really fast. Uh, it, it's a lot faster. Um, the reason it can be this fast is we're doing some additional optimizations for the new hardware. Um, but, but as you can see with, like this order of magnitude increase in speed, uh, our iteration speed and the way we work, like our entire workflow can be uh, different. It allows us to work in a much more iterative manner. Uh, we can test out many more things and we sort of don't have to wait for several hours to get our results. So previously we would be sort of blind, launching jobs all over the place and, and then waiting for the results to come in. Here we can get them immediately. Uh, and that's allowing us to work much faster than before. Um, another side bonus for us is this workflow fits pretty nicely into the way we work otherwise. So we're sort of, uh, we're shipping our checkpoints directly to GCP. We have our credentials, like a small subset of our credentials uh, on the A100 machine and we use Docker anyway. So the things are working really smoothly for us. Uh, but if there's anything, it's it's a bit hard to keep it fully utilized. I mean, it is so fast that we have to really work to <laughs> keep it uh, under any load. Uh, and a queuing system or something like that might help in the future. Uh, but we've really had uh, tremendous use out of the machine. Uh, super thankful for uh, sort of the collaboration with AI Sweden. And uh, you guys have always been really good with, um, you know, uh, working with us to find uh, ways of uh, having our work uh, running at your machine. So super thankful for everything. Um, 
And that's all I have. Thank you so much. Thank you, Agrin. Uh, it's really exciting the work you do. Uh, Thank you. I'm, uh, what will you be doing next? Well, I mean, we are just starting this work, right? So uh, we are going through the first iteration with you guys. We have until end of February. Um, we think this is a very good uh, direction. Uh, this is within the, um, uh, the sort of um, uh, language models for Swedish authorities uh, project and fits there really nicely. So we're going to expand on this a bit more uh, and see where that takes us to begin with. Yeah. Maybe some publications eventually? Eventually, yes. Uh, but uh, we'll see how this uh, works out, right? Uh, we need to make sure that we beat S SOTA for that, probably. Yeah, super interesting. Thank you so much. And uh, as we heard before from Andreas Lander at Scaleout, you are also working with them a little bit to use the Edge Lab uh, yeah. for a different project. So this is really exciting to hear what you're working on. Thank you. Thank you so much. And maybe you're staying on for a little bit more um, so that you can answer some questions that may come in in the Q&A. And we are taking a short break again. So you can stretch, stretch fill legs. up the coffee. Yeah. And we will be back here at 11 sharp. Um, we have one more hour. And what will happen during that hour, Eva? First, we'll have a look at data sets, uh, especially one data set that Henrik was, will tell us about, very new into AI Sweden. Uh, we'll have a discussion about the legal questions that come up with AI, uh, together with Lin Sommerson from uh, uh, Max Lafer. We'll have Peter Blecket from Comcom um, to open up for the offering of Meet a Data Scientist. And then we'll finish up with how to build a data factory. So pretty full schedule yeah. this last hour as well. Yeah. And we will start with Henrik. Yeah. So yes. welcome on board, Henrik. Thank you. Can you hear me? We can hear you well, and you can try to share your screen as well. And this is the release of the Volvo Highway data set. Super exciting. Yes. And so, this means um, that we have it available at the data factory right now. That's right. So uh, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Hendrik Kaiser. I'm delighted to be here. I think it's been a super day so far. Um, I've seen lots of cars. Let's now try to make this even better by bringing in some trucks. Because I'm from uh, the Volvo Group, the truck company, um, where I work uh, at the Volvo Autonomous Solutions Unit, um, which means that I'm on a very exciting journey where we uh, develop self-driving solutions. That would be self-driving trucks, uh, self-driving road machines, and so on very fun place to be right now. Um, so I'm here today to talk very shortly about the data set that we have created and that we will release now to or have released to AI Sweden so it's available to all partners. Um, this is the Volvo Highway data set and here is a short overview. Um, it has camera images. So camera is the only modality in the sensor set, roughly 29,000 images. Uh, these were taken in, in traffic situations. So we've been out driving and, and uh, recording video and then selecting images from that. Um, and uh, it was uh, on, on different Swedish highways uh, close to Gothenburg where we grow the track. Uh, then we have put annotations on this. So for uh, objects, we have, I think it's uh, seven different classes like car, truck, bus, etc. And uh, we have two kinds of annotations for the objects. It's, it's the pixel mask. So you can do the, the segmentation uh, style of um, object uh, detection. And we also have bounding boxes. It's, it's two dimensional bounding boxes in, in this data set. Uh, lane markings are also annotated, and we have a, used a quite complex model here where, where we use segments. Uh, so that means we can represent quite uh, tricky uh, traffic um, environments. 
the road edges are, are also represented. So in this case, it's more or less the, the edge of the asphalt, but it could be like if there's a jersey barrier or a guardrail or, or something like that, that would also be uh, annotated as a road edge. And finally, we have free space, which is quite typical. It's just a, a pixel mask describing whether the corresponding surface is free or not. Uh, I think all of this is pretty standard. You have probably seen it before, many of you. Uh, what is maybe a little bit different is that we are, the camera perspective is a little bit higher since this is a truck and, and uh, not a car. Uh, let's see where we put the camera. So here are some further details. Uh, the truck here is our golden truck that we've been driving around with. Um, the red dots show where we had sensors mounted on it. The cameras that are now in the data set is, uh, were located here in, in, in the mid of the, um, uh, along the midline of the truck uh, behind the windshield. Uh, this is roughly 2.3 meters above ground, so it's typically a bit higher than a normal passenger car. Um, we also had other sensors. For example, we had lidars attached here to the rear view mirrors. But uh, we, we, the brackets we made were not sturdy enough. So uh, when we were out driving, we had too much wobbling of the, of the LIDARs. So the data was not really useful. Um, you learn something new uh, every day, right? Uh, every day. And uh, I think uh, making the brackets sturdy enough is uh, quite important in this business. Um, the right picture here shows uh, what routes we were driving. Um, and essentially, we made life easy for us because we're Gothenburg based and we, we took the highways that, that are close to Gothenburg. So we, it's the E6 up to the Norwegian border and then also southwards down to Malmö. Uh, we also drove along, uh, let's say this is e, uh, E4, right, to Linköping and then E20 to Örebro. Another aspect that is important for data, as Ebba touched upon now regarding uh, legal things, uh, is uh, GDPR. And uh, our lawyers in this case recommended us to, to anonymize the data set before handing it over to AI Sweden. So if you look carefully at this image here, uh, the, the closest vehicle, you can see that there is no registration plate. Uh, it has been blurred. So we have blurred all the registration plates and all the faces to anonymize the data sets. And by that, we, we are thinking we are um, making sure that we comply with GDPR. Uh, regarding seasonality, we collected data throughout more than a year. So we all different seasons are represented. We have diversity. There is snow, there is autumn colors, etc. So there's a lot of... Uh, things to train for in the data set. Uh, a few words on what companies uh, created the data set and how it was done. And there was something called the Perceptron project, which started in 2017 and ran for three years. This is an FFI project. So I, I want to take the opportunity to, to thank our sponsor, FFI then, for making this project possible. Um, my role here was that I was the initiator and, and sort of creator of the project. And then I was coordinator of, of the project most of the time. Uh, the consortium was Volvo uh, and we, we were making the data sets. And then Semcon and Chalmers were also part of the project, providing valuable advice on how to do the data set. Um, but of course the project was not only about making a data set, but also how to use it. So we, we made a lot of uh, deep learning activities as well. Um, the annotations of the data set uh, has been done by Anotel, a well-known firm in, in, in Gothenburg, I would say. Um, and they did a really great, great job on that. So finally, I want to say a few words on why we are contributing this data set to AI Sweden. Um, and it's to make this really simple, um, I think it's obvious that Volvo needs AI in many 
different applications. I just listed it down three of them here. So within autonomous driving, there are many hard problems like object uh, classification, for example, and then this data set could help. Uh, within powertrain control, you can do many things. Uh, one thing we did a while ago was to uh, do energy management in a hybrid. Um, another thing is predictive diagnostics. Uh, which um, means that you try to predict what components will fail in the future and when they're going to fail. And uh, with that knowledge, you, you can optimize your maintenance visits to, to so the visits to the workshop. And there are countless examples of what needs we have for AI. So uh, with that as a fact, uh, it's rather obvious that Volvo benefits from having uh, strong AI competence in, in the region and, and in Sweden overall. So we believe by uh, it's a good idea to collaborate with AI Sweden and by providing the, this highway data set, we believe we will get something back. Um, what strengthens AI Sweden strengthens Volvo. Um, as a concrete example, um, AI Sweden is now actually preparing a course within AI that will be uh, run at Volvo. So uh, that's something we will get back. And uh, I think this is a good example of what Mats Nordlund talked about earlier this morning, uh, the different kinds of value uh, creation uh, AI, the, the data factor in AI Sweden has. Um, so this is sharing uh, competence, right? By that, I conclude my little presentation. Um, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to take that now, or Ebba, do you want to schedule that later? Yeah, if you can stay on, that would be great. Uh, you can see the questions in the Q&A tab, Henrik. So keep an eye yes. and see if someone types in a question for you, and please uh, type in your answer so everyone can see, uh, because it gets posted for everyone to see when you have answered it. Okay, I'll hang around for a while. Yes, please. And uh... yeah, and thank you so much, Henrik. Mm -hmm. yeah, that really emphasizes something. Uh, I know uh, Anna Westerberg also from, from Volvo Group or, or now Volvo Trucks uh, said earlier when we had the, the Sweden Innovation Days that partnership is really the new leadership. Uh, so to become successful in, the, successful in the future, you need to partner up with people and organizations and institutions that can solve challenges, your challenges together with you. Uh, and I think sharing data sets uh, is, is one of the things that you can really do early on to create both potential value for the ecosystem, but also to fetch back value to your own organization. Uh, and I know the discussion with Volvo has been uh, around this data set is that, okay, yeah, Volvo can, can make and, and create some value out of the data sets, but maybe five, 10% of the potential value, the rest of the value that can be created is outside their own organization, but that they really can get back when uh, or other organizations and other teams create solutions based on the data sets. Uh, and uh, what we really want to uh, highlight is that you can now see uh, the available data sets in the data factory on AI.se under the data factory. So on our uh, home site or on our site, all of the available data sets are there. And we also want to challenge organizations to host hackathons. Because, mm. uh, uh, well, um, Chital uh, just uh, presented the uh, um, the Nordic Verge hackathon. Mm. Uh, and uh, I know AstraZeneca was very impressed by the results from the teams that during the um, AZ uh, hackathon. And I think we also are in discussion with Volvo. So please uh, also use the data factory, not only as uh, a uh, in infrastructure, but also as an uh, opportunity to share your data sets exactly. and to challenge the uh, Swedish and Scandinavian and global AI ecosystem. Exactly, so we can use the data factory for the teams uh, performing in the hackathon. So we can really collaborate on everything with AI Sweden, with all these teams that sign up and with the corporation. And that's how you could see the amazing knowledge sharing or uh, for Volvo, for example, to yeah. see what could you actually do with this data set if you let data scientists, data scientists go, go crazy on it. Yeah. So we're looking forward to, to uh, getting your feedback within uh, a couple of months, Henrik, as well, to see the development on the data set. Sure. 
Thank you so much. Looking forward Henry. to that. And we'll now head into some of the questions that Henrik mentioned, the legal issues. Uh, because I myself, I have a background as a lawyer. I have also Josefin Remsgård, our colleague, who is the legal coordinator, and we work very closely together um, with the legal questions, yeah. specifically concerning the data factory. And we've seen a lot of issues turn up in the different projects that we have. Some are, of course, GDPR related, and others are related to licensing of data sets, for example. Um, so for uh, we've also had a lot of help in this in this work and one of those people who have helped us a lot is Lynn Samuelsson from Max Law Firm. Yes, hello, hi. I think I will help to you to turn video. on the camera. <laughs> exactly. Uh, hold on. Okay. But you hear me okay? Not okay. Uh, yes. We can hear you. But we cannot see you. Just hold on. There she was. At the top. I get a message that I've been stopped by the host. <laughs> yep, we did that when you came in earlier. <laughs> yeah, we Great. are there. We can see you. Perfect. Great to have you with us, Lynn. Great to be with you. Thank you so much for having me. And as I said, we are really appreciative of the work that you and Max Law Firm had put down in the data factory and setting the legal structure. And we'll dig into that a little bit deeper. But first, um, can you just present the yourself and the Max Law Firm a bit more? Yes, sure. My name is Lynn Samuelsson and I work as a lawyer and I'm a partner as well at the Max Law Firm. Um, uh, I work very, um, I mean, my spe specialist area is digitalization and AI. Um, and uh, I mean, as a law firm, uh, we are a full service corporate law firm. So we assist companies with various issues within all legal fields. Um, but one of the focus areas that we have both internally for our internal work, but also our core business being legal advisors is uh, digitalization and AI. And this obviously, I mean, it affects so many areas. But in uh, Gothenburg, it, of course, has a lot to do with the automotive industry, for example. And um, uh, by that, we've come, I mean, we've spent a lot of time at Lindholmen uh, and we've come in contact with AI Sweden. And uh, yeah, that is uh, the background to uh, our involvement with you. And then you, for example, also have um, specific experience of data factories uh, also from before, right? Uh, yeah. Of the procure <clears throat> procurement of such and uh, uh, which not many lawyers today out there have, I would say. Yeah, no, but I mean, we've been, we've worked a lot with, uh, I mean, within this area. And uh, as I said, we're different. I mean, it's all from, I mean, with the automotive industry and development of AI, it's yeah, data factory and that kind of compute and storage issues. But then, I mean, we work with, um, e-commerce and those aspects of digitalization and uh, I mean all the GDPR issues that come into play for a lot of different companies but when it comes to AI and the very I mean swift technology um, movement uh, on on these issues we saw that uh, even more here than any other area we need to keep completely I mean stay focused and informed of what our companies and companies in general are facing, the challenges they have and truly understand that. And that's not something we can do just, I mean, staying at home, uh, but we need to get out there and obviously work with our clients, but also to broaden our um, platform, then um, yeah, to work with you and teaming up as a partner that was just, yeah, definitely something we wanted to do. Great. And as I mentioned before, you have been helping us with setting the legal structure for the data factory. And we have yeah. to together identified a few areas where law comes into place and, and where you really need to have at least some basic structures to be yeah. able to run this kind of infrastructure and handle the projects that we have. And first of all, we identified. So, for example, when the data factory wants to take in a data set, yeah. there's a license normally that we get. Yeah. And um, we have elaborated a bit on uh, what, what's the main things that you need to remember when having such a, or getting such a license. Yeah, I mean, there are different aspects, but for, I mean, for AI Sweden, it's uh, also being the collaborative partner and connecting uh, different um, 
I mean, companies. Uh, and uh, so it's it's uh, a lot about uh, ensuring that the terms for the license for uh, the don the donor, so to say, the uh, uh, the party. Um, donating the data set to the data factory. Uh, what is uh, uh, that company prepared to, to warrant, for example, in respect of, I mean, what the data contains? Uh, is it personal data? Uh, can we guarantee the quality of the data? Can we even say, I mean, what the data uh, consists of? And this obviously varies depending on, I mean, how old the data is. <laughs> and um, because a lot of older data, it hasn't been collected for these purposes. so. There's no, no traceability in that way. And then we need to weigh that against what is the uh, receiving company prepared to license on what, what kind of terms would be acceptable to that company. And obviously that is depending on what you, what you want to use the data set for. But so the licensing is a lot about um, weighing risk, um, uh, kind of, um, yeah, making the different parties aware of that. And, and also of course, dealing with um, personal data issues so that's something that we spent a lot of time about yeah what kind of warranties in relation to that can we can we uh, request and yeah so that is um some of the fundamentals of that work and also uh, in relation to com commercialization for example that mm. complicates things a little bit right yeah it does especially i mean what we have with ai sweden you're not i mean you're supporting the research uh, and can't really take part in uh, commercial projects. Um, but of course, we can see that um, companies coming into the data factory to use it in the first instance for research and, and testing and developing, they will uh, potentially uh, use this for commercial purposes further on. But um, then that is something you need to, I mean, go kind of like, around the data factory circle, the AI uh, circle and, and the contract directly with the, uh, yeah, with the party who, who let you into the data set in the beginning. So, and that is also that something that we support, of course. Um, I mean, AI Sweden. So, um, but in the data factory, the, the right to, of use is quite uh, uh, restricted uh, to, I mean, just to, to research and uh, testing. Exactly, and not developing a full product within AI Sweden, for example, but doing some POCs or uh, uh, at least getting a feeling of what you can do, and then you take the commercialization kind of out of into another setting. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. so there are ways of solving this. Uh, yes, definitely. I mean, there's no. <laughs> yeah, there's. Um, I think that is something that you, as a company, should consider uh, already when you. Uh, go into, I mean, the data factory to test uh, and use the data factory for your evaluation purposes to to ensure somehow that you can continue with this if it's um, something that you want to do. And then uh, we will, I mean, we, I mean, you will assist them in, um, yeah, in, in making that connection. So again, it's a partnership. It's a platform for uh, reaching other companies. So it's, um, yeah. So definitely um, something you can you can solve. So the reason why it's non-commercial within AI Sweden is because it uh, needs to be, but um, it's not no. exactly. But the, it's not a full stop no. uh, just because of that. And it also kind of depends on the license that we got from uh, the donor how yeah. how openly they want the data set to be shared in the next level. And that kind of brings us into that we usually need to have a license then for data factory users who want to use the data set. And there we see kind of the same issues really, right, Lynn, with the risk assessment and the commercialization questions. Yeah, definitely. Th those are the issues. So you need to ask yourself already when you, when you, yeah, when you sign that license agreement, which will be then a license agreement between AI Sweden or Lindholm and Science Park and uh, the user. And uh, that will uh, be included in the, in the user agreement for the, yeah, for the data factory as such, because when it comes to the users of the data factory, we have worked out a structure where we have a um, data factory user agreement, which is then for the organization um, to, uh, to utilize the uh, infrastructure and the data sets, I mean, depending on which data set you're interested in. And um, we have chosen a structure uh, 
I mean, which we as lawyers think it's um, <laughs> brilliant. <laughs> so, yeah, brilliant <laughs> and beautiful. No, but uh, <laughs> but it's um, yeah the the concept and the the idea behind it is that um, you would sign a user agreement once and then you can update it and you also bring the specifics into the specific. Uh, use specifications where you define what your purpose is for the specific use and what data set you're interested in and uh, the license that you're given to that within the concept of the data factory. So uh, it's um, it's a package made up of, uh, so to say, typical legal um, terms and conditions, but also a practical aspect. So uh, where we want to uh, kind of um, yeah, make sure we we understand and, and kind of get that to the practical aspect of using the data factory. Yeah, and I think you already pointed out something there that it's, we're really trying to be agile on this side of, of uh, the data factory to, to make it smooth and easy. So it's the general terms and conditions uh, that you have to agree on once. And then if you come in with more use cases, you just update the use case and the data. So I think we've found a really good structure. We've actually received some very positive uh, comments on it. So it seems to be fairly usable. And uh, just a short hint into, we you were touching on it. GDPR is, of course, one of the major issues to solve uh, to be able to be compliant and still share data. And I can just say that we at, uh, at AI Sweden, we are working with these questions in a few different projects, uh, out of which uh, the RODL project is one that has uh, created a group of the lawyers from uh, the different stakeholders yeah. uh, who would have continuous workshops on trying to solve how to share data sets in between the organizations. And that's been really, really um, helpful. And eventually we are aiming to share the knowledge and the results from these discussions. Mm -hmm. And the same with the federated learning work package on the legal questions. And maybe yeah. you just want to say a a word on that thing. Yeah, because just to say a quick word that uh, we're working on. Uh, yeah, the, um, the the federated learning project where we uh, we investigate mainly the the um, yeah GDPR and uh, privacy issues. If we can solve some issues with that, uh, I mean not sharing the actual data but the trained models. Um, uh, to what extent we can actually potentially completely avoid the GDPR if anonymization is possible, uh, or otherwise have um, enough. I mean. Uh, security measures undertaken so we kind of uh, at least then meet those uh, uh, requirements so uh, that is one uh, project that we are involved in yeah it's uh, very interesting and I mean when it, I would just to say that when it comes to GDPR the issue is that if we can't know for certain that there's no personal data it's all about a risk assessment between the different parties using the data sets so it's not always a perfect world but uh, as long as you analyze the situation and um, yeah kind of make the risk assessment for you and your business and uh, yeah that's the work that needs to be done but as you say the federated learning project will definitely have some interesting results at least uh, to share eventually on uh, how you can combine different techniques to at least be more compliant and uh, live up to the technical and organizational measures that you are demanded to take. So that's super interesting. And last of all, I just want you to mention a few words about the legal expert group. We have the next meeting tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, a very great initiative. Uh, it's um, because we as a law firm, we're the only partners so far. I want to, I mean, if there's a, possi a possibility for others to join, that would be great uh, because the uh, concept is collaboration and we need to include so many different also lawyers and uh, legal uh, <clears throat> experts into this work. And that is something that then has been initiated with by you with the legal expert group where we gather lawyers uh, practicing and different co partner companies into one group discussing these issues uh, in practice, uh, depending on the situations that these uh, lawyers have come across uh, within their businesses. So it's, I mean, it's super helpful for moving this as swiftly as possible forward. Yeah. Exactly. And we hope to have uh, results in form of um, conclusions and results um, as white papers, for example. Yeah. 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 Come out of this group. A question from from uh, from the chat because there's mm -hmm. a question for for you, Lynn. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, but I will make that more general. Uh, is it possible for outsiders to ask questions to the legal expert group? 
Um, I think eventually we'll look into uh, having some kind of function like that. The first step, I think, is to have the legal expert group do continuous webinars yeah. so that we can uh, see what discussions we've had, what are the most hot topics at the moment, and then do a webinar on it. And then, of course, be able to ask some questions there. It is a little bit tricky to handle like specific use cases because every case is really specific yeah. uh, and, and uh, have a legal advice on that so then i think it's actually better to turn directly to lynn for example yeah. uh, to get that kind of advice but of course we're hoping to put together as much information as possible yeah. uh, with regards to league questions and also we mm. work with other organizations around sweden yeah. on this so as you said lynn to fast track uh, yeah. to find yeah. the solutions and get this uh, forward but lynn if you have time maybe to stay on uh, for a little bit um, but just keep an eye on the Q&A and see yeah. if there's some questions that you can reply to there. And yes, we yes. say thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much. Always a pleasure to join. And thank you for a great uh, seminar and yeah, today. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Okay, yeah. bye. 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 And we will head on to Peter Blecket. Hello. Let's see if you can see me as well. Hello, guys. Yes, we can. Hi. Good to see you. Thank you. Good to see you too. And Peter, you are actually one of our one of these contributors that I mentioned in the beginning of the webinar. Uh, partners that have actually contributed and put their best persons in the data factory team. So we were lucky enough to have you for a few months uh, mm -hmm. before or the last year, and you are connected to the data factory still. But now you're working on two of your own projects with Quamcom. Um, but you are here today to present the concept of Meet the Data Scientist. Yes, and, and that is something that we did uh, for AI Sweden for all the partners. So this is not a, a Quamcom um, presentation, even though we have started to, to work with this. Uh, so I will tell you a bit more about this one. Uh, should I start then? Um, yes, please. Let's see. So... Um, what we have put together, uh, when we did the data factory, we saw quite early that, that we have the need of, of uh, helping our partners uh, to accelerate the applied AI. And, and one of the ideas that came up during the autumn was a, a concept that we call Meet Data Scientist. And I will tr try to briefly explain it today. Uh, and uh, if you have questions, uh, how to do it and how to, to uh, get involved, please uh, contact me or Ebba, and we can walk this uh, through a bit more. Um, it's, sorry, we should remove this one as well. Um, it's a, a really simple uh, kind of way forward. What we want to do here is that uh, you've heard me talk earlier about the yellow and the blue bubble. Uh, the, the yellow bubble is, is where we work in, in kind and, and we try to accelerate AI in Sweden. But we see as partners that we can't just work in, in kind all the time. We need to make our businesses work in, in, in the real world as well. So therefore we have the blue bubble, which is where we do business. Um, and I think that this is really super exciting. So I'm really excited to present this for you. And in the blue bubble, we also do, uh, well, there it costs money, so to say. So the idea that we have is that we would like uh, partners to come to AI Sweden because AI Sweden is, is the, the FATIS facilitator in, in this um, with their IDs, with the data, with the businesses and with things that they want to get help with. I will give you an example later on of one of the test cases that we have done. Uh, then in, in AI Sweden, and, and this will be Ebba in the first case, uh, they look at the partner, what kind of problems that they want to solve and, and, and that. And then they look for a supporting partner. Uh, and in this case, uh, the first case that we did was Quamcom. But here I, I really, uh, stress out that here we would like to have more supporting partners so EBBA and AI Sweden can choose the perfect match for the partner that comes with it, with this issue. Uh, and then we set up a, a, a basic uh, workshop. Uh, the first workshop, the partner comes in, presents its problem, presents its data, uh, and presents its idea of, of how they would like to start their AI journey. 
uh, the supporting partner you know, brings uh, AI competences into this one, and we discuss it a bit back and forth uh, of, well, data, where you are with the data, and, and how to move on. Uh, and this is totally free for the partner. Uh, usually, and this we saw in the first test case that we did, uh, we need a second seminar as well because usually we have a lot of questions when it comes to the data, which the partner don't really can answer at the first time. So they need to go back, do some homework, and then do a second session for this one, where we basically form a, a way forward for the partner um, and look and, and see how we can help them solve the issue. Uh, still, we are in the yellow bubble, which means that we are still trying to, to piece the puzzles to, together uh, and to try to see how we can help the partner. Once we have done that, uh, we go over to the blue circle. And here we start a project, a proof of concept, uh, something more where we work more together with, with the partner. Uh, so here, uh, the supporting partner and the partner who just wants help uh, start to, to collaborate and work together. This is where it starts to cost money uh, for the partner. So here, the supporting partner usually adds their data scientists or whatever kind of competences is needed to solve the problem. Um, and the partner is, is, um, is paying this one. Uh, and this one is done outside of, of AI Sweden. Uh, once we... Um, uh, once we have found solutions, we have found a proof of concept, we have found results that we want to have. Uh, from an AI Sweden point of view, we would like uh, the partner and the supporting partner to come back to AI Sweden and, and to do a breakfast seminar or webinar in some way that we show and share the result of what we have done. Uh, because for me, this is what AI Sweden is all about. Um, helping each other and showing what, what we are doing. Um, and also in, in, uh, <clears throat> in the blue bubble, AI Sweden is, is bringing project competences. It could be also that we need to bring in other competences like uh, uh, legal that we just heard about and, and so on, which perhaps the supporting partner don't have. So we try to, to build the blue bubble as, as a complete project as possible for, uh, for the partner. Uh, as you see down in the corner, we also have a good relationship together with Vinova. Uh, so in this case, uh, we also could um, have the possibility to get funding and support from Vinova. Um, but that is something that we bring up from case to case, basically, and see how we do that in, uh, in the best way forward. Um, so... For me, this is a, a, a program, a project to, to kickstart the, the AI journey for our partners, uh, to see how we can accelerate uh, AI in Sweden, but we do it through businesses. We don't do it through just uh, uh, free uh, workshops. We also do it by the company of the partner and themselves uh, uh, adding uh, mon money into to their problem. And as I said, uh, today we have done this once. We did it for, for Salgrinska University, um, where we have worked together with one of their departments and tried to look at uh, their data uh, and how to, to apply AI to, to that one. Uh, in that case, we are in, in the middle of, of the yellow and, and the blue, we should say. We see that the data needs to be a bit more um, handled before we can go into and do an efficient project with this one. So, so hopefully in the spring, we can come come and, and Sol Greska can come back and, and show you a bit of, of the result of that one. Uh, but I would like here to, to say that we, uh, may I say AI Sweden, we would like to have more supporting partners with different competences so that we can bring this to our partners that want to kickstart a journey and say that, okay, this is what you uh, can choose from and, and how to do that. Uh, we do this in the AI Sweden arena. Um, and there are many reasons for, for doing that. One of the biggest reasons is that we want this to be in, in one arena so we can see how 
how we can, in the most efficient way, help the partner that wants to start their AI journey. And since we have it in, in one place, we know all the different start your uh, meet the data scientist programs that we have started. Um, we, can, we can see how we most efficiently use them. And we can point to, to the perfect match for you when it comes to a supporting partner. Um, I can talk a lot about this one and, and this really excites me because here I see that, that we, we now start to, to learn and use the business side of AI as well, uh, because this is important. We can't just have the yellow bubble. We need to have the blue bubble as well in order to, to, to move and to be a, a great AI nation. Uh, so I think I stopped there, uh, Ebba. Uh, and Peter, and if you have questions and so, please let me know. Thank you, Peter. And now we have a familiar face, Mats is back, back <laughs> live. Uh, and thank you so much for presenting this. I think this is a very valuable uh, offering from the Data Factory and of course for, uh, from you from Quancom. So we really want to encourage other uh, consultancy firms that have data scientists, just as you said, to take up on a, this offer to also be part of offering these workshops going forward. And all the other partners, of course, take Peter up on this offer to meet the data scientists and see what you can do with your data. Uh, this is a really important first step to kind of get going. Uh, and I think it's very valuable and we'll make sure to share a lot of the outcomes from these workshops. So. Thank you so much, Peter. We uh, look forward to seeing the results from the Sagenske case eventually. Thank you. So thanks so much. And now we'll head into the last uh, session of this whole webinar, and it's about how to build a data factory. Quite important. It's uh, no doubt a very important topic. A lot of us in the industry and elsewhere, academia and so forth, have made investments, and we've learned how uh, it differs perhaps from installing a, a regular IT environment and it's not always straightforward. So I'm glad to announce that with us here now for this last session, we have two of our uh, experts on the field, uh, Ola Eriksson from AI Sweden, who has participated in a lot of the establishment of data factories around in Sweden and also made a huge contribution to the Edge Lab you saw earlier and Mika Klintberg in Örebro uh, at the node there. Uh, and they are going to present this section for you. So over to you guys. Okay, um, då ska vi se. Uh, hör ni mig? Yeah, you man. Yep. We can hear you well. Perfect. Then I will share uh, my screen. You see my screen also, please? We see it, but in the presentation mode. Yeah. And so. Now we're over to the right. That's yep. good. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is uh, Mika Klintberg. I'm working as a senior project manager. I will give you some short insights uh, from the academia and how we have been working with uh, the data factory. Um, Örebro uh, Nord uh, has been a part uh, within AI Sweden since uh, the end of 2019. And uh, the host organization is uh, Örebro University. Uh, already, um, uh, when we uh, joined uh, AI Sweden, uh, Örebro University has already invested in some compute and storage hardware at uh, Örebro uh, University from Project ET, uh, a partner uh, within AI Sweden. And we saw a really big interest uh, in cooperation in our region and really tried to um, accelerate the use of applied AI. And the partner that we really uh, put up together have the same needs and question regarding the data factory questions. And we try to, to really build up some, some common knowledge together with uh, our uh, friends in AI Sweden National and the interest uh, from, from both, uh, of course, the university, but also from Örebro uh, municipality and also from uh, SEB, the Swedish authority, and also the county of Örebro. 
we gather all the people both from the management level and also from the strategic and operation level and just start discussing about how to to share knowledge and and also accelerate the the use of applied ia and of course we have already seen uh, both eva and mats speaking about these different uh, areas that's really important and of course when we gather all this uh, together we, we can uh, achieve a lot it's not only about the hardware it's also of course a lot of the data and the compliance and the competence and uh, we have done this with just starting a regional uh, co-sharing of, of knowledge and uh, one of my favorite slides within AI Sweden is really this one that we really invest together and share with all and also cross sector and uh, with this slide I will uh, end my presentation and, and give uh, the word to my colleague Ola Eriksson will he will go much deeper in the technical side but it's a really really interesting journey we're doing this uh, together thank you for for me and Ola hi everyone uh, my name is Ola Eriksson and I'm a technical advisor for the data factor team within AI Sweden I'm here today to share some experiences with you from building data factory solutions. I'm going to try to cover two topics today. The first is infrastructure and toolchain considerations for AI. And the second one is security considerations in an AI environment. I have been working with infrastructure since the late 1990s. And in the last four years, I've been focusing mostly on infrastructure for AI. I remember the interview for my first data factory assignment. I had been building pretty complex continuous integration environment recently and I was pretty sure that this wouldn't be much different. So during the interview, I pitched a solution based on Jenkins that I was sure would solve the problem. And I guess everyone else in the room thought so as well since I got the assignment. However, it soon proved that it would be quite different from what I had been working on before. The first thing I discovered was that AI infrastructure is not the same as traditional IT infrastructure. Even though it's still just computers, networking, storage and all that, AI does put an interesting twist on things. I also discovered that AI is not the same as high performance computing. Even though they try to achieve similar goals, AI infrastructure needs to be set up in a somewhat different way. So comparing AI and IT infrastructure, the first thing that you will notice is that AI infrastructure is far from mature. This for the simple reason that it hasn't been around in this form for more than a couple of years. This compared to normal IT that of course still evolves, but more in a sense of new iterations of existing technology rather than huge technology changes that happens in the field of AI. You will also notice that there are very few reference cases for AI infrastructure. This compared to IT, where just about anything you want to do has been done before in one way or another, and that there is usually lots of documentation on white papers, resources, and even packaged products available. With AI, you will be more on your own, and you need to investigate for yourself which solutions is best for your particular requirements. AI infrastructure is also in a big sense workstation technology that has evolved into server solutions. This means that you will find things in your AI data center that you might not find in your average environment, like extremely power hungry GPUs for example. And you will also notice that some things that you expect to find in your everyday setup might not always be present in your AI solution. Another big difference is that with AI you will have a lot of resources, but in very few uh, servers, which might sound like a good thing since fewer components require less maintenance. But it also means that you have the same or even more resources and requirements packaged into a much smaller space, which impacts everything from power delivery and cooling to networking and storage. Also, with AI, requirements tend to scale upwards very rapidly. So where you in your normal IT setup might be looking at mid-range products and trying to find the best solution within your given budget, you would with AI probably be looking at the high-end products, trying to figure out which of them delivers most resources in your particular workload. So, why is AI different from HPC? The first thing is that traditional HPC is CPU first, which means that the CPU is doing the majority of the computations and if there are GPUs available, they will in most cases be add-ons that offload specific tasks from the CPU. 
With AI, it's GPU first. This means that the GPU is doing the heavy lifting and the CPU is supporting it by, for example, providing it with data to process. Also, similar to IT comparison, there is a big difference in the number of servers in an environment. Where you with HPC would have hundreds or thousands of servers, you would with AI, using top level servers, get away with just a few percent of that number. However, that does not mean that it costs less. Another big difference is on the toolchain side. With HPC, you would run a few jobs on many servers. That's the whole point of HPC, to spread the workload over multiple nodes to increase the compute performance. But with AI, you would rather see many jobs on each server, due to the simple reason that not all projects can benefit from the full set of resources in a top spec GPU server. This might not sound like a big difference, but if you look at many tools designed for, for traditional HPC, you will notice that they simply aren't designed to run multiple jobs on one node. AI also requires more of everything per server. This means more power, more cooling, more bandwidth, more storage, more everything. This means that your supporting infrastructure, like data centers and network components, needs to support the same requirements, or more, on a much smaller space with fewer nodes. Imagine the concentration of resource requirements if you take the resources of a cluster of 2000 servers spread over 100 racks with 100 network switches supporting it, and concentrating that same throughput and power requirements into 20 servers in 4 racks running on 2 network switches. Security is also a key factor for AI. Much of what we do in AI is processing data, and that data needs to be protected, no matter if it's your enterprise's IP, medical or personal data, or if it's any other type of sensitive data, it needs to be protected. And security has not been top priority with vendors so far, but this is nothing strange. Focus has been on performance and functionality, and this is the same for almost every new technology that emerges. Features and results pay the bills, and security comes afterwards. Also, multi-tenancy is hard to implement, and with this I mean sharing resources between users. It could be a service provider that wants to have multiple clients on the same hardware, or a university that needs to share multiple projects on the same cluster, or even an enterprise where teams with different security clearances share resources without having access to each other's data. Another heavy factor on the security side is that a big part of the AI ecosystem is based around Docker, which is great. Docker solves a lot of critical problems that would otherwise have serious impact on AI development. But it comes at a cost, which is that Docker isn't designed to be running in a setup where normal users can interact with a Docker service, which is the case in most AI setups. Basically, this means that any user, among other things, can impersonate any other user on that cluster, even the system administrator, and have more or less the same permissions as that user. And this puts additional requirements on the security solutions implemented by your storage setup. Since if the security is based on a trust between the server and storage, where the storage trusts that the credentials provided by the server are valid, and Docker on the other hand allows for one user to impersonate another, that means that you have a potential risk for data ending up where it shouldn't. So, to summarize, AI infrastructure comes with some unique challenges. But if you are aware of these challenges and if you prepare for them, you will be just fine. As Eva mentioned, Ola does indeed have a lot of experience, probably one of the most experienced persons in the country when it comes to how to do this and what kind of problems you can encounter uh, on the way and how to prevent these from happening. And we also have a, quite a few of our partners are also experts on this. No doubt, yes. So, so uh, it's, it's a good uh, group to get together with if you are considering buying or investing or signing up for some kind of infrastructure or cloud solutions and discuss with peers here of, of what are the best ways, what are lessons learned and then how to succeed at doing this. Exactly. And it's also part of the test bed where we yep. mentioned you can try out different data factory solutions. The ones that we have available today uh, through ourselves and with CGIT and with Google that we mentioned, with HPE, for example, we're looking forward to uh, finding more partners who want to offer uh, what they have. And we also do have an announcement to make today from the data factory team. And I will share our presentation again because we are actually scaling the data factory a bit. Much. Yes, yes. So um, we are now um, in the planning and preparation to issue uh, or start a procurement uh, process to get uh, some complementary hardware for the data factory. 
uh, we plan to issue a call here on the 8th of February. <coughs> and it's um, being formulated right now. Uh, it's um, in the order of about 10 million SEK. Um, the details will be released on the 8th. Um, and it's the first step in a series of steps. The other steps will be guided by our partner needs and input from you who are here asking our questions, asking questions from us now over the next weeks um, and months and so forth. So we will post information about these uh, on AI.se. So those of you who are interested in participating in that or contributing or giving us some uh, guidance for later stages, um, keep watching that uh, website for more information. Exactly, but we're planning to open up the first call, as you mentioned, on February 8th. Yes. Um, so we will uh, make sure that there is information available for everybody who's interested yes. uh, in, in this. So keep, keep an eye on the website for this. It's interesting news. We look forward to seeing what, where this will take us. It yep. depends so much on the partners and what you want to do, what way we take with the data factory and how we scale it and what we make out of it. Really up to you. So that's one of our calls to actions that we yes. want to send with you today as we are now wrapping up this webinar. Mm -hmm. And we are happy to mention that we've had some media attention uh, now with the Edge Lab and from today. And there are articles in uh, Dagens Industri, Ny Teknik and Computer Sweden that you can look at today about the Edge Lab, for example. So that's really good yes. and interesting news. Yeah, it's, um, been a, uh, it's great that we are getting the attention in the press so that it's more visible what we do here as partners and, and what opportunities that we can build here. So it's. Um, it's very encouraging and I look forward to continue to build this with all of you and uh, for all of you. Yeah, so our major call to action now is get engaged and contact us Yes. to make sure that something happens and that we create this together and that we learn together. And we want to say thank you to all the participants, uh, everyone who's attended the webinar, of course, all our speakers that have made great presentations, given us a good inspiration. We've had some international uh, contacts with MIT, uh, so it's really getting traction with the Edge Lab. Yes, yeah, and it's it's up to us to push this forward now as fast as we can and, and really build something exciting on the Edge. So stay tuned on what's going to happen with the Data Factory, and uh, we will definitely be back soon. Thank you so much for today. Yep, thank you. Thank you very much.